Hello everyone this is part 7 of what if Naruto was banished and becomes Rakage, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below. Alright then Kakashi you go get your people ready and I get mine. Since the battle for Nami no Kuni is about to begin, spoke Inari to which Kakashi just nodded again and left with the other team leaders. And let us hope that we can survive it, thought Inari as he grabbed his samurai helmet and left to marshal his force to defend their homeland. Several hours later in the village of Wave in the past three hours since the sighting of the Kiri fleet the defenders of Nami no Kuni Wave Country rallied themselves into position to defend their country, while the forces of Kanoa went ahead to the forest near where the Kiri ships would land. They would then try and delay the Kiri forces for as long as possible until the Wave Samurai and the militia were ready. When the Kiri forces landed Tenten and her team launched a long-range attack from the cover of the forest onto the exposed Kiri Nins who were landing on the beach. They fired kunais, kunai grenades, exploding kunais and shurikens down at the unprotected kiri ninjas and killing many, Shino also added support by sending his bugs off and draining the chakra of many kiri shinobis causing them to fall uncurious due to lack of chakra. Yamato helped by having wooden spike come up from the ground and impaling several kiri nins. Soon after the Kanoa teams made the preemptive attack they quickly fell back when they saw more kiri nins arriving in larger numbers. As they fell back, the teams activated the traps they had set up earlier along the way so to slow down the Kiri Nins more and to try and lessen their numbers as much as possible. After they had activated all their traps the Kanoa teams fell back to the village and behind the wooden walls that Yamato had made. After another hour or more the Kanoa teams and the defenders of Nami no Kuni saw the Kiri Nins arrive, where over 600 Kiri Shinobi surrounded the fortified village on all sides. But what worried the Kanoa Nins most, was when they saw the Kiri Nins bringing out several large volley guns out of the forest and positioning them around the village. With Isarugi Rajuta, leader of Kiri Invasion. As the Kiri Nins surrounded the village of Nami no Kuni, the commander of the Kiri Invasion force Isarugi Rajuta the last remaining loyal member of the current Kiri no Shinobagatana Nananan Shu, seven swordsmen of the mist stood watching from his command point on a small hill overlooking the village. He saw his invasion forces spread out around the village, he had 600 shinobi surround the village and had the remaining 200 in reserve back at the landing beach. Although his forces had taken some loses from when they landed on the beach and when they were traveling through the forest to get to village, since some Kiri Nins had been killed or wounded by the traps that the Kanoa teams made, his forces were still pretty much intact. As he looked over his force, a Chunan came up to him to make his report. Rajuta to Senpei we have surrounded the village as you have ordered and the volley guns have been placed into position, spoke Akiri Nin Chunan. Good, shall we commence our bombardment on the village, asked the Chunan. No, we will not, we will blow the walls around the village and take the village as intact as possible, replied Rajuta. Sir, asked the Chunan. The village is in a strategic position for us, since it is right next to the bridge, where we can use it as a supply base and a command point for when we open up the next front against Kanoa, spoke Rajuta. Very well sir I will give out the order for a hole to be blown into a wall, replied the Chunan. Wait, called Rajuta, I want you to blow four separate holes on each side of the wall, one of the left, one on the right, one on the front and one behind them. Then place our forces evenly on each side, so that they are in groups of 150 men at each side and those groups are also split into three groups so that we can send them in waves of 50. When that's done I want you to send two teams from each side into each hole as skirmishers. But sir, what about the shinobis that our forces encountered at the beach, from the reports there are at least six or seven teams. Also there will be no doubt, that there will be many samurai there as well, those teams we be sending won't be enough to deal with all of them and the civilian fighters there, spoke the Chunan. Those men will be only scouts fool, I want to try and test their defenses first after which I send a few more in the hopes of luring out the shinobis there and see who they are, answered Rajuta. Do you think they're from Kanoa, sir, asked the Chunan. That is very much possible. But how did they find out about us invading Nami no Kunai? We kept it top secret. They most likely they learned it from the toad sage Jiraiya, since he is infamous for finding things out through his spy network, replied Rajuta. Very well the Rajuta senpai I have what you have ordered done, spoke the Chunan and then left. 
Soon after Rajuta gave out his orders the four holes were made on each side of the wall, and the teams were sent through the holes. As the teams moved forward they were attacked by the Nami no Kuni militia, where men were positioned inside building and their roofs and would fire their crossbows and bows and arrows at the shinobis. The Kiri shinobis were at first caught by surprise where one or two of them were killed, but they soon quickly reorganized themselves and forced the Nami no Kuni militia back. But when they did and chased after the retreating militia, they quickly encountered the streets leading to the center of the village had been barricaded and fortified. When they engaged the defenses, they were hard-pressed to break through the defenses that the Nami no Kuni defenders had made, and were beaten back by the defenders where two more Kirishinobis were killed. After which all the teams on all sides fell back and called for reinforcements, where three more teams were sent through each hole. When the reinforcements joined the forward teams, they all quickly attacked the Nami no Kuni defenders on each front. Where they began to force back the defenders and killing many of them, due to use of the kunai launchers and the jutsus as well as their superior fighting skills. When the Kiri shinobis were about to break through all four fronts the Nami no Kuni samurai lead by Inari joined the fight. After a few minutes of fierce fighting the combined forces of the militar and the samurai whose skill could equally match the Kiri shinobis, were able to drive back the Kiri shinobis with heavy losses. After seeing this Rajuta ordered the first wave one on all sides to move forward and attack the Nami no Kuni militia and samurai. After Rajuta gave the order 200 Kiri shinobi started to pour into the village and began to attack the Nami no Kuni militia and samurai, who were being driven back with heavy losses. For 20 minutes there was fierce fighting between the two sides, after which the wave defenders were once again on the verge of collapsing. Inari continued to try and get his men to hold the line, but he clearly could see that the sheer numbers of the shinobis were overwhelming them. Even with the narrow streets and buildings limiting the Kirinins' numbers and keeping them from overwhelming them completely it was still not enough to stop the Kirinins. Hold the line men don't let the break through, keep fighting, cried Inari to his men as he fought against several shinobis. Inari blocked two separate sword slashes with his two his two swords, he then channeled his chakra into his swords where his chakra quickly covered his swords, after which he then used his chakra to act like a buzzsaw and cut right through the two Kirinin swords and then the shinobis themselves. After killing the two Kirinins, Inari then channeled more chakra into his swords to extend the cutting edge of his blades and had them take the shape of long saber swords so to fully use them against the Kirinins. As Inari fought the Kirinins he killed several more of them and just as he killed his tenth Kirinin he quickly brought up his blade to deflect several kunais fired from four Kirinins. Inari then quickly countered by firing two crescent-shaped chakra blades at the Kirinins, where two of the Kirinins were hit and cut in two while the other two avoided the hits by jumping up into the air. Seeing this Inari quickly fired two more crescent-shaped chakra blades at the Kirinins, but as they avoided the two crescent-shaped blades in midair, they quickly realized that the crescent-shaped blades were just a distraction. Since as soon as Inari fired the crescent blades he quickly threw his swords at the Kirinins, since he knew they would dodge his attack. The Kirinins were too occupied in avoiding the crescent-shaped blades that they failed to notice the incoming swords towards them, until it was too late, and were pierced in the chest by Inari swords when he threw them and were both killed instantly. As soon as he saw the Kirinins fall to the ground dead, Inari quickly drew out his other two swords, where he quickly twirled around and slashed at the stomach of a Kirinin that had tried to sneak up on him and opened up his stomach causing his to die slowly. But as soon as Inari had killed the Kirinin an exploding kunai hit the ground right under his feet and exploded, causing him to be blasted several feet away. Thankfully Inari's armor had protected him from any serious harm, but it had bruised him up a little and his head was spinning from the blast. But once he fully regained his senses he saw that three Kirijonans had surrounded him with their swords drawn, one of them then raised his sword up and was about to bring it down on Inari when he suddenly stopped move. W what h happening to m me, I see can't m move, cried one of the Kiri Jonans. M m me too, cried another. What's going on, why can we move, what kind of jutsu is this, cried the third Kiri Jonan. It's called Kijmei no jutsu, shadow imitation technique, spoke a voice behind them, where once Inari looked he saw Shikiyamaru standing behind them. And this is the Kage Kubi Shibari no Jutsu, shadow neck bind technique, spoke Shikiyamaru as he did a few hand signs and a shadow hand extended from the men's shadows and went up to their necks and strangled them. Once the three Kiri Jonans fell dead, Shikiyamaru went over to Inari and helped him up. You guys took you sweet time, spoke Inari with a slight smirk, 
since he was grateful for Shikiyamaru for saving his life. Sorry, as troublesome as it was, we had to wait till the first wave was fully in the village streets before we could attack and cause the most damage. So you're ready? asked Tanari, to which Shikiyamaru just nodded after which he took out a seal note and activated it, where as soon as he did explosions were seen happening all around the village. During the battle between Inari forces and the Kiri forces, the Kanoa teams hid themselves in the building, where they waited for Inari forces to draw in the main part of first wave deeper into the village streets. As soon as the first wave of Kiri Nins were fully in the village streets and were advancing forward, Shikiyamaru had activated the exploding notes that had been planted on the buildings around the Kiri forces and the ground underneath them. As soon as he activated and the notes exploded killing many Kiri Nins with the blasts as well as crushing many others from the rumble of the buildings that were blown up and wounding many others. After the explosions the Kiri forces were in complete confusion as their ranks had been heavily hit by the explosions and many of the Kiri Nins did not know what was happening. Song. Naruto OST 1 Strong and Strike. As soon as the Kiri forces were in confusion from the explosions, the Kanoa team struck. At the western part of the village, Yamato used his Mokuten abilities to create wooden walls cutting off the confused Kiri forces, where Tent and team quickly swooped down on them and dealt with them easily with a barrage of kunais, kunai grenades, exploding kunais and shurikens. At the same time Shino used his Kikaichu parasitic destruction insects to quickly swarm over the trapped Kiri nins and drain them of their chakra. Sai also assisted by using his Choju Giga Super Beast's imitation picture to pounce down on the trapped and confused Kiri Nins. While the former bridge builder Tazuna lead the wave militia men in the western part of the village in attacking the confused Kiri Nins. At the eastern part of the village, Shikiyamaru, Ino and Choji used their combined teamwork to overwhelm the Kiri Nins, where Shikiyamaru would freeze the Kiri Nins in their places with his Kijmei no Jutsu and Choji would then use his Nikuden Sensha human bullet tank and crush the Kiri Nins. Ino did her part by using her Shinranshin no Jutsu mind-body disturbance technique to cause several Kiri Nins to attack their allies and cause more confusion in the Kiri ranks. She even used her Shintenshin no Jutsu mind-body switch technique to take over the bodies of several Kiri Nins to sneak up on other Kiri Nins and kill them. Inari rallied up his samurai and the remaining militia forces and had them charge forward to drive the Kiri Nin back. Along with them Sasuke's two root agents Badger and Boar supported the advance. Badger used several powerful genjutsus like the Suji Main Bando no Jutsu, String Bean Bind Technique, Kurama Clan Technique, where the Kiri Nins found bean vines growing out of the ground and wrapped around their bodies and lifted them into the air. After which a bean pod rose from the ground and revealed Badger with his Tanto in hand where he killed them all swiftly. War used Buban Biker no Jutsu Partial Multi-Size Technique to sweep aside several Kiri Nins with his hands and crush them between his hands or into walls and into the ground. At the southern part of the village Konohamaru was in the lead with Kiba, Akamaru, Lee and Guy. As Konohamaru and the others pushed forward he engaged the Kiri Nins with Enma in his Kongonyoi form, Adamantine NYOI form. Where together they were taking out Kiri Shinobis left and right with the use of Konohamaru's drunken monkey fist style, since the style was too unpredictable for Kiri Shinobis to try and block or avoid and confused many of them. Mogi and Udon supported Konohamaru from behind as he pushed forward where Mogi would trap the Kiri Nins in several genjutsus like the Magen, Jubaku Satsu, Demonic Illusion, Tree Binding Death, the Aikiboku no Jutsu, one with the Tree Technique, and Shibari no Jutsu, Bind Technique, while Udon would the quickly sweep in and finish him off. Lee and Guy were also taking out many Kiri Nins as well where they used their strong fist style with devastating effect, crippling many Kiri Shinobis. Although out of all of in the group Kiba and Akamaru were doing the most damage and killing the most Kiri Shinobis, since they used their Jinju Konbi Henge, Sotaro, Man Beast Combination Transformation, Double Headed Wolf Garoga, Jewel Wolf Fang, Suga, Piercing Fang, and Gatsuga, Jewel Piercing Fang, to devastating effect since in the narrow streets and buildings the Kiri Nins could do little to dodge Kiba's and Akamaru's vicious attacks where most were mowed down. At the northern part of the village Kakashi was leading the charge forward where he used and copied several jutsus from the Kiri Shinobis and used them against the Kiri Shinobis. He also used several earth jutsus to block some of the Kiri Nin's water jutsus. Closely following Kakashi were Neji and Hinata where they used the gentle fist to kill or disable any and all Kiri Nin's. Between the two of them, Hinata was doing the most damage with her Degeki Sendo Death Strike, where she literally sent any Kiri Shinobi she fought flying with every bone in their bodies broken. 
She also practically destroyed the whole street as well as many nearby buildings when Yus used her Kamageki, Divine Strike, 2 A. Sasuke was also near Neji and Hinata, where he fought and killed many Kiri Shinobis with his lightning and fire jutsus. As he fought the Kiri Nins he cut through their swords with his Kusanagi no Surugi, Chidori Gatana Kusanagi Sword, 1000 Birds Katana, and killed many more with his Chidori Iso, 1000 Birds Sharp Spear, Chidori, 1000 Birds, and his Katan, Goruka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Great Dragon Fire Technique. Tenten and Kuranai give long-range support for those in front, where Kuranai use her Genjutsu to keep the Kiri Nins confused and keep them from reorganizing themselves. While Tenten took out the Kiri Nins with the Kunai launches and prevented them from hitting any of the others. But after they had been all dealt with Tenten then wiped some blood on a seal on her arm and took out a Jian 3 and a small handheld metal fan which was connected with an extending chain to the Jian, and proceeded to engage the Kiri Nins close combat. Sakura also did her part by going around and helping bring back the wounded to the center of the village where she was trying to heal the wounded. She also helped protect many wounded men from attacking Kiri Shinobis by using her superhuman strength to intimidate them and keep them at bay while she healed the injured. And those that were foolish enough to keep trying to attack her were sent right into the ground hard. She also used her side tanto to block any Kiri Nins with swords that had attacked her or a wounded man and then slashed or stabbed said Kiri Nins that attacked. Soon after the Kanoa teams had entered the battle the tide turned against the Kiri forces and their lines began to collapsing on all sides where many of the remaining Kiri shinobis were retreating. Song. Naruto OST 1 Strong and Strike ends with Rajuta. Saji, Citri, 4, ordered Rajuta to the Chunin he had been talking to earlier, as he saw large numbers of his men retreating and he wanted to know why. Sir, our forces are being pushed back with heavy losses due to the combined efforts of Kanoa Shinobis, Wave Samurai and the Wave Militia, answered the Chunin Saji. Where he then explained how the first wave had been lured in by the Wave Militia and Samurai and were hit by a surprise attack. So Kanoa did send forces here, though Rajuta, how many Kanoa Shinobi teams are we dealing with in the village? We're dealing with six teams, sir, a total of 24 shinobis, replied Saji. Just six teams. How can six shinobi teams, a small force of samurai and a bunch of rabble kill so many of our shinobi so quickly and so easily and drive them back, asked Rajuta angrily. Sir the forces in there have been well organized and the streets and buildings there are small and narrow so our forces can't use their numbers to their full advantage. Also the Kanoa shinobis that our forces are fighting in there are not ordinary shinobis, replied Saji. What do you mean, who are they, asked Rajuta. From our reports from our men all three members of the Neo Inoshika Cho are there as well as Kopi Ninja no Hitaki Kakashi, Kopi Ninja Kakashi Hitaki, Kanoa no Chiyu Sakura, the healing Sakura of Kanoa, Haruno Sakura and Sasuke Uchiha leader of Kanoa Root Division and the last Uchiha in Kanoa. Our men also say that Mokuten user Yamato, Kanoa no Enku Kanoa's Monkey King, Sarutobi Konohamaru and his aunt Yuhi Sarutobi Kureni Kanoa famed Genjutsu specialist are there. Also with them is Kanoa Kedakai Aoi Moju Kanoa's prideful green beast Maito Gai, Kanoa Nadaim no Kedakai Aoi Moju Kanoa's second prideful green beast Rock Lee, Okami Ken no Kanoa Kanoa's blade mistress Mikumo Tenten, Higyushiroi White Strike, Hyuga Neji. We also confirmed sightings of Abarame Shino captain of Kanoa's Oinan division, Hunter Ninja division. His second in command Inazuka Kiba and the Hyuga Shikyo no Megami, the Hyuga's goddesses of death, Hyuga Hanata as well as several other skilled shinobis in the village as well, answered Saji. So Kanoa had sent the best to try and stop us, spoke Rajuta out loud and then smirked, it seems that fortune has smiled down upon us. Sir. Think about it, Kanoa found out about our invasion and so they decided to send a force to stop it. But since they couldn't afford to send enough men to stop us without weakening their other lines, they decided to send quality over quantity and send the best shinobis to stop us, spoke Rajuta. But Rajuta Senpei, what did you mean by fortune smiling on us, asked Saji. Isn't it oblivious, if we win this battle not only will we gain control of Wave, but we will also take out most of Kanoa's most powerful shinobis in this battle. This also shows that Kanoa must be desperate to send their very best shinobis to stop our invasion. So if we win this battle it will make our victory over Kanoa almost certain with most of their best shinobis gone, replied Rajuta. And the greatest glory of this war will be mine, when I bring new that we eliminated Kanoa's best shinobis. 
If they knew about our invasion, why did they not just destroy the bridge? asked Saji. My guess is that they knew it would only delay us at best before we would rebuild it, or we just use the island and transport our forces by boat from here. Also from what I heard a few years ago a shinobi who Kanoa banished and who was later on killed by the rogue shinobi group the Akitsuki, is considered a hero here, replied Rajuta. Why would Kanoa care about that? Especially if they banished the shinobi, asked Saji. From what I heard the shinobi that they banished was banished on bogus charges and they suffered greatly for it, since it seemed that the shinobi they banished was well connected with a lot of important people. He was considered a hero both here as well as in Haru, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow Country, and Takagaku, Hidden Village in the Waterfall, since he saved both this country and the other two. He was also considered a friend to the current Kazekage, which is why both Kanoa and Suna have a very strenuous relationship. Also he was supposedly on good terms with the Wasabi family of Cha no Kuni. So when they banished him Haru, Yuki no Kuni cut all trade with the village as well as any mission they would give them, the country village Yukigaku, the village hidden in the snow also broke their alliance with Kanoa. Soon as Kazekage practically tore their new treaty with Kanoa apart, Takagaku broke their alliance with Kanoa, the Wasabi family used their influence with the Cha no Kuni Daimyo to send all his missions to Suna. While this country cut all trade agreements with Kanoa and refused to even let one of their ninjas in it and sent all their missions to Suna. Which hurt Kanoa economy badly, since this country took over Gato's shipping industry when he was killed and that industry is a major shipping trading company in the Central Elemental Sea, answered Rajuta. So Kanoa basically banished the wrong person, replied Saji. Correct, since that the reason why Kanoa has been declining over the years. But there more to this story, since the shinobi that they banished wasn't just any shinobi he was a jinchuriki, the jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Yoko, the nine-tailed fox, said Rajuta, shocking Saji. That why the Akitsuki went after him and killed him, since he had the Kyubi in him and those Kanoa fools practically handed him to them. Also according from what I heard the people here built a gravestone for this shinobi somewhere in this country, after they learned he was killed. That is also why the Hokage is so desperate to save this country, since not only will it stop our new front from opening, but also to save the gravestone of that shinobi. Since supposedly the Hokage, Suan cared for the shinobi a lot and was against his banishment, but was overruled by her counsel, said Rajuta. Guess that just shows how you should never let a woman do the job of a man, since even the strongest of women like Suan allowed themselves to be pushed around by people who are supposed to advise her. Maybe I will find the gravestone of this shinobi she cares so much about and send it back to her one piece at a time, thought Rajuta with a slight chuckle. Rajuta Senpei, what are your orders then? Shall I have the second and third waves prepare to attack and have the reserves brought up? asked Saji. No, have the second wave move in by themselves, ordered Rajuta. But sir, the second wave by themselves won't stand a chance against the caliber of shinobis in the village, as well as the other forces in the village, said Saji. Just do what I ordered you to do, Chunan, half shouted Rajuta. H. Hi, replied Saji as he was about to go before Rajuta called him back. Also when you have done that, prepare the volley guns to fire on my order and load them up with the gifts that Kusagakur, the village hidden in the grass gave us, ordered Rajuta. Sir, asked Saji again, but as soon as Rajuta turned around and looked at him, he quickly saluted him and did what he was told. Soon this battle will be over and Nami no Kuni will belong to Kirigaku, the village hidden in the mist, and I will be its hero, thought Rajuta with a smirk. As soon as Rajuta gave the order the second wave of Kiri ninjas were sent in to attack the village, when the Kanoa teams and the wave defenders saw the approaching Kiri shinobis they quickly took up defensive position and prepared to fight. With Shikamaru's group all around Shikiyamaru there was intensive fighting going on, Anaru and his samurai were fighting with several Kiri swordsmen, Choji was bashing away at any and all Kiri nins that were within his sight, since Choji had some major payback that he wanted to give to the Kiri nins for when he was held prisoner. Badger and Boar were doing their part, where Badger would put several Kiri nins in a paralyzing genjutsu and Boar would then use his buban by no jutsu to make his hand bigger and crush them. Ino also gave support to any of the others that needed with her mind manipulation techniques. It was just when Shikamaru had killed another Kiri Nin with his trench knives, that he saw a Kiri Nin coming up behind Ino while she was distracted with using her Shinranshin no Jutsu on a Kiri Nin. 
Acting quickly Shikamaru took out and threw a dozen or so exploding tags into the air and then performed his cage nui no jutsu, shadow sewing technique, and had each of the shadow tendril hold a tag. Where he then sent the tendrils toward the Kiri Nin, where they tied the unsuspecting enemy to a building wall and where the tags then detonated killing the Kiri Nin. When Ino felt the explosion she quickly turned around and saw the dead Kiri Nin body, she quickly realized what had happened and that Shikamaru had saved her. Watch your back Ino, it will be too troublesome for me to keep watching it all the time for you, said Shikamaru. Thanks Shikamaru, I will, replied Ino. It was after a few minutes of more fighting that suddenly Shikamaru and the others heard whistling sounds as if something was flying through the air. After which there were small explosions everywhere with purple clouds cover the whole village. With Konohamaru's group at the same time that Shikimaru and his group were fighting the Kiri Nins on the eastern part of the village, Konohamaru and his group were fighting the Kiri Nins in the southern part of the village. Konohamaru was fighting against a Kiri Jonan swordsman with Enma in his Kongonyoi form. As he fought the Kiri Junan, Konohamaru quickly dropped onto the ground and did a quick leg sweep, knocking the Jonan on his back. After which Konohamaru quickly brought Enma down on top of the Junan head knocking him out. Just as Konohamaru had finished knocking out the Junin he found himself surrounded by six more Kiri Nins. Just when they were about to attack him on all sides, Konohamaru quickly stabbed Enma into the ground and then threw himself into the air, using Enma as a center place to keep him center as he spun himself around 360 degrees around Enma, knocking the charging Kiri Nins away with his feet in midair as he spun around. Once he steadied himself, Konohamaru quickly then grabbed hold of Enma and then threw him at one of the first nearby Kiri Nins who had got back up. Just as the Kiri Nin was about to dodge the staff, Enma arm came out of the staff and grabbed hold of the Kiri Nin neck and choked him to death. After Enma quickly changed back into his normal form and attacked another one of the nearby Kiri Nins. As Enma was dealing with the two Kiri Nin Kanoa went to handle the remaining four, he then quickly made a cage bunshin, shadow clone, where the cage bunshin then did a doton, doru tiger earth style, earth flow river, to transform the ground underneath the stands into a river of mud to throw him off balance. After which Konohamaru quickly then did a doton, doryuden earth style, earth dragon bullet, and fired several concentrated mud bullets at kiri nins. But before they could hit, Konohamaru quickly did a katan, kayuden, fire style, fire dragon missile and exhaled a long stream of incredibly hot fire to light the mud bullets on fire making the mud bullets into lava bombs the lava bomb hit two of the kiri nins where they were burnt alive while they screamed in pain the other two were able to use a kawarimi no jutsu body replacement technique and replace themselves with a mizu bunch and water clone seeing this konohamaru quickly took out his extendable battle pole and flicked the switch to extend it to its full length he then quickly sent his cage bunshin to deal with one of the second remaining Kiri Nin while he handled the other. He quickly engaged the Kiri Nin, where the two fought bitterly against one another with a traded blows with one another. During the fight Konohamaru quickly fell backwards to avoid a horizontal slash from the Kiri Nin, whereas he fell he then quickly raised his hands over his head. So that when they touched the ground he then pushed himself back forward with both his legs in the air, so that he could give a full front double kick right in the face of the Kiri Nin that sent him flying into a nearby wall and knocking him out. Once he got back on his feet Kanoa quickly turned to see that his clone was about to be destroyed by the second Kiri Nin on a nearby rooftop. Quickly racing over to the rooftop with impressive speed Konohamaru arrived just in time to see his clone being destroyed. After which he then charged a raising gun in his free hand, and slammed it right into the unsuspecting Kiri Nin stomach, who had just turned around to face Konohamaru and was blasted right thrown a nearby building. Just as he defeated the Kiri Nin, Konohamaru's shinobi senses told his to duck which he thankfully did, since as soon as he ducked a kunai flew right through the spot where his head was just moments ago. Quickly doing a 160 degree turn, Konohamaru quickly located the Kiri Nin that shot him, who was about 80 feet away on a rooftop with a Kwani launcher. Seeing this Konohamaru quickly threw his extendable battle pole forward right at the Kiri Nin who was aiming to fire again at Konohamaru. The battle pole quickly flew through the air and before the Kiri Nin could dodge hit him right in the head knocking him out. After the Kiri Nin was knocked out, Enma came over to Konohamaru and then turned into his Kongonyoi form again, after he had defeated the two Kiri Nins he had been fighting. Just when Enma had returned to him Konohamaru's shinobi sense kicked in again and told him to move. Where he then did a quickly back flip and right over the head of a Kiri Jonan that tried to sneak behind him strike him from behind. 
Once Konohamaru had landed behind him he quickly slammed Enma into the side of the Jonan head and sending him flying into a nearby wall and making a large dent in it. After dealing with that John and Konohamaru decided to go find the rest of his group and join up with them. After about a minute or so Konohamaru found them all. Guy and Lee were crippling or knocking out every Kiri Nin that attacked them or who came near them. Udon and Mogi were working together to taking out several Kiri Nins, while Kiba and Akamaru were slaughtering and all Kiri Nins that they saw. Among them as well were several of Inari's samurai many of the wave Miltia who were trying to do their part in defending their home. Just when Konohamaru was about to go join them and help he heard whistling sounds as if something was flying through the air. After which there were small explosions everywhere with purple clouds cover the whole village. With Tenten's group at the same time that Shikimaru, Konohamaru and the groups were fighting the Kiri Nins on the eastern and southern parts of the village, Tenten and her group were fighting the Kiri Nins in the northern part of the village. Tenten was currently in a deadlock with a Kiri Jonan swordsman, for a few minutes or so the two were evenly matched as they clashed swords. With one another cutting each other lightly on different parts of their body, this continued until their swords were against once another where both of them were trying to push the other back in sheer strength. Deciding this was going nowhere Tenten decided to give way and allow herself to fall backwards and use the Kiri Jonan own momentum against him. By causing him to fall forward and onto the ground, once the Jonan fell on the ground Tenten quickly jumped away from him. Since when the Jonan fell over her, she quickly placed a high explosive on the Jonan body where as soon as she jumped away the note exploded before the Jonan could even try and take it off. Once the Jonan was dealt with Tenten and went off to engage several more Kiri Nins. Just as she had killed her twelfth opponent Tenten quickly saw a Kiri Shinobi on a nearby rooftop with a Kwani launcher aimed at Kurani, who was too busy fighting against two Kiri Shinobis to see the Shinobi. Seeing this Tenten quickly brought the metal fan that was linked with her Jian sword by a chain and then flicked a small switch. Which caused several spikes to spring out of the slats, she then flicked another switch and fired the spike at the unsuspecting Kiri Nin and killed him. Once she killed the Kiri Nin she quickly saw from the corner of her eye several kunai coming at her from her right side. Seeing this she quickly deflected the incoming kunai with her Jian and metal fan but as soon as she did she saw another Kiri Nin, who appeared to be a Jonan doing some seals before crying out, Sutan, Mizu Kamakiri, water style, rising water slicer, and fired a powerful fast jet of water that sliced through the ground as it ran through it and towards her. Reacting quickly Tenten quickly brought up her fan and activated a third switch on the fan where the fan extended outward and grew size and width and then became a large round shield that Tenten was able to hide behind. When the water attack collided with Tenten's shield it pushed her back into a building wall that was behind her, as the attack pushed her back it torn up the ground. But thankfully her shield held up and was able to withstand the attack. After the attack the two Kiri Shinobis were about to move in and attack Tenten, who was still trying to recover from the attack. But before they could, they were in turn attacked by Neji and Kakashi who saw that Tenten was in trouble, where Kakashi came from behind the Kiri Nin with the kunai launcher and rammed his Rei Kiri lightning cutter right into the Kiri Nin chest from the back. While the Kiri Jonan was intercepted by Neji who appeared right in front of the advancing Jonan and before he could defend himself, Neji struck him with a hand single hand strike to the stomach and killed him. After regaining herself, Tenten quickly thanked Kakashi and Neji and then went back to join the battle. Soon after, she saw a Kiri Shinobi advancing on Sakura, who was too busy healing a badly wounded wave samurai to notice the Kiri Nin from behind her. Seeing that she could not warn Sakura in time, Tenten threw her fan at the Kiri Nin, where it quickly wrapped around the surprised Kiri Nin. After which she then channeled her lightning affinity, 5, into the extending chain which traveled along the chain to the fan and electrocuted the Kiri Nin causing him to fall unconscious. When Sakura heard the screams of the Kiri Nin, she quickly turned around to see the Kiri Nin, who tired to sneak up on her being electrocuted by Tenten. When the Kiri Nin fell unconscious, Sakura turned to Tenten and nodded her thanks, which was returned by Tenten before returning to finish healing the wounded samurai. After saving Sakura Tenten quickly brought back her fan, where she then threw it again to attack a Kiri Shinobi who was about to swing his sword down on an injured wave militia man who was on the ground. When she threw the fan it quickly wrapped around the Kiri Shinobi sword and before he could do anything about it. Tenten pulled the Kiri Shinobi towards her, thanks to her super strength that she had gained from training under Sunid. When the Kiri Nin came flying towards her Tenten quickly let go of the chain and raised her fist and hit the Kiri Nin right in the face sending him flying right through a building wall. 
after defeating the Kiri Nin Tenten then went and fought against two more Kiri Shinobis with swords. They fought and traded strikes with on another for several minutes, with neither side giving up much ground until Tenten kicked one of the Kiri swordsmen at the back of his leg making him lose his footing. This then gave her an open opportunity, where when she blocked a downward slash from the other Kiri swordsman with her folded metal fan and then quickly twirled around behind the Kiri swordsman and cut his head off with a single slash from her Jian sword. After the first swordsman was killed the second one attacked her from the side with a horizontal slash, but was blocked by Tenton's Jian. Where she the brought up and opened her metal fan and flicked the switch to bring up a new set of spikes from the fan and used them to slash the man's throat open and bleed out. After killing the second Kiri swordsman Tenton saw five more Kiri nins advancing towards her with their kunais in hand. Seeing this Tenton the flicked another switch that caused her fan to extend outward again and grow. But instead of letting it become a large round shield she stopped it about halfway so that it would just become a large fan. Showing her impressive feat of strength by rising the large metal fan with a single hand she then channeled her wind chakra into the fan and cried out, Futon, Daytopper, wind style, great breakthrough, and blasted the Kiri Shinobis as well as many others behind him away. After dealing with the Kiri Shinobi Tenton turned to see how the other were doing where she saw Sasuke using his Chidori Senbon, 1000 bird Senbon, to paralyze several Kiri Shinobis and the striking down with his katana. While Hanata was using her Chakra Hari, Chakra Needles, B, to paralyze several other Kiri Shinobis, much like Sasuke did. She then used Sensatsu Susho, Thousand Flying Water Needles of Death, to surround the Kiri Nins with thousands of water needles and have the strike the Kiri Shinobis from all sides killing them all and cover them from head to toe in needles made out of water. After seeing this Tenton decided to go and help them out but before she could she suddenly heard whistling sounds as if something was flying through the air. After which there were small explosions everywhere with purple clouds cover the whole village. What the wave defenders and the Kanoa teams were unaware was that the second wave of Kiri Nins sent by Rajuta were just a distraction. Whereas the second wave of Kiri Nins were fighting against the Kanoa teams and the wave defenders, Rajuta had his men load up the volley guns with small exploding kunais with large pouches filled with a special poison powder from Kusa tied to them. So that when they were fired and the kunais exploded the poison powder spread over the entire village. The poison powder that had been developed by Kusa, where once it becomes airborne it could be inhaled in the air. Causing the affected person's body to go numb and unable to move the body correctly and to be unable to use and control their chakra correctly. The poison also would quickly disperse and become harmless after a few minutes of being released. Within minutes both the attacking Kiri Nins in the village and the defending wave forces as well as the Kanoa teams were affected by the poison. They then all started to fall to the ground, breathing heavily, with their bodies numb and unable to focus or use their chakra. Rajuta had fired the poison-carrying kunai when the second wave was attacking since he figured that if he fired before the second wave attacked. The Kanoa Nins would have somehow blocked the kunais with a Mokuten Jutsu or something, before they hit the village or they would divert the kunais to fall out outside the village with a Wind Jutsu or something. So he decided to send in the second wave to keep the Kanoa Nins and the wave defenders distracted until the kunais had been fired, believing that the loss of 200 more of his men were acceptable losses for winning the battle. Soon after the poison had been released by the explosion, it dispersed leaving most of the remaining wave defenders on the ground on the ground numb and unable to move, while the Kanoa team struggled to keep themselves standing up and even move. Once the poison had dispersed, Rajuta then ordered the third wave to move forward into the village and personally lead it himself, so that he would have the honor of taking the village and killing the Kanoa Shinobis himself. Within minutes the weakened Kanoa Shinobis and wave defenders engaged the third wave of Kiri Shinobis in a fight for their lives. Narrowly dodging a kunai strike to the head, Kakashi grabbed the wrist of the Kiri Chunin that attacked him and before he could pull his arm back. Kakashi twisted the man arm breaking it with a single motion, as the man screamed in pain, Kakashi quickly punched the man in the face and knocked him out. After knocking the Kiri Chunin out, Kakashi started to pant heavily and then wiped the sum sweat that was falling from underneath his forehead protector. The poison that the Kiri Nins had released greatly weakened him and the other Kanoa ninjas as well as the wave samurai, since it took nearly everything they had to stand up and move let alone fight. As Kakashi surveyed the situation, he saw several weakened wave samurai being killed by some Kiri Nins with their swords and kunais. At the same time he also saw several helpless wave militia men being killed by another group Kiri Shinobis with their kunai launchers. 
he even saw Tenten, Neji and Kureni struggling to hold off several Kiri ninjas. After seeing this Kakashi knew that their situation was hopeless and if they did not retreat now they would be all slaughtered by the Kiri forces. It was then that his two former students Sasuke and Sakura appeared separately in front of him. Sasuke had several small light cuts on his face a large one on left arm and bleeding badly, while in his right hand he held his katana, which was dripping blood most likely from the Kiri Nins he had just fought and killed. Sakura was carrying her tanto in her right hand and also had several cuts on her arms, legs and sides and her clothes were fairly torn up. Both of them looked fair tired and weak, although Sasuke tired and failed to appear unaffected by the poison, thanks to the poison and look worse for wear. Kakashi Sensei, all our defensive lines on all fronts are on the verge of collapse they can barely hold out against the Kiri Shinobis and the wave defenders are being slaughtered. What do we do? asked Sakura. We need to retreat now, before they butcher us all, answered Sasuke before Kakashi could even answer Sakura. But what about Inari and Tazuna as well as the rest of the wave defenders, cried Sakura. We leave them of course, this country is already lost and there's no point in us dying here with the rest of them, besides if we leave now we can use them as a rearguard to cover our retreat across the bridge, replied Sasuke without any emotion. We can't. They be all slaughtered, cried Sakura angrily. So, better them than us, we at least still have our village to defend, spoke Sasuke without as much as a hit of remorse. Sasuke we can't do, shouted Sakura angrily but was interrupted by Kakashi. Sakura, as much as I hate to admit it Sasuke right we have to abandon wave now or else we will be all killed, said Kakashi, which caused Sakura to turn with a look of disbelief on her face when she heard her former sensei. Before she could even speak, Kakashi then spoke again. Sakura, I know how you feel, I don't want to leave and abandon wave any more than you do, but we have to think of the village first, since we need to leave now so that we can continue the fight later on. Beside the Hokage orders were clear, that if the situation looked hopeless, we are to leave Nami no Kuni and retreat back to Kanoa, said Kakashi sadly since he didn't like abandoning Wave any more than Sakura did. But what about the Kiri ninjas? Even if we break out and get across the bridge we won't be able to make it to back to Kanoa, since they follows us across and in our condition we won't stand a chance against them, spoke Sakura. Not if we destroy the bridge when we cross it, answered Sasuke. We won't be able to do that in time Sasuke, since the Kiri forces would be upon us before we finish setting up enough exploding notes in time, replied Kakashi. They've already been set up, replied Sasuke, surprising Kakashi and Sakura. A few nights ago I had my men set up and place enough high-powered exploding notes along the bridge to completely destroy it. So once we are across it we can blow it up, halting the Kiri advance and gaining a new front at our rear, which was the objective of our mission wasn't it. That was against the Hokage orders Sasuke, our mission was to defend Wave not destroy the bridge and that won't stop Kiri from opening their new front it will only slow them down, spoke Kakashi as he frowned at Sasuke, who remained impassive. Would you rather let Kiri have it and use it to open up their new front against us? Besides it better later on than sooner and besides I don't take orders from that old hag. If she would actually do her job, she destroy that bridge, she just letting her feelings for the dope cloud her judgment like the rest of you. Anyhow someone had to plan ahead unlike the rest of you, scoffed Sasuke, which caused Kakashi to narrow his visible eye, but decided to leave Sasuke blatant disrespect for now and turned to Sakura who was glaring angrily at Sasuke. Sakura I need you to go and inform the others to meet us at Yamato and his team position on the western part of the village, and tell them that we are leaving the village and retreating back to the bridge, spoke Kakashi in a serious tone of voice. At first Sakura just stood there and did nothing but quickly regained herself and nodded in understanding. Since although she didn't like it she knew they had no other choice, Nami no Kuni was lost and they needed to live on so to defend Kanoa. But before Sakura could leave a new voice suddenly spoke up. So you're all going to betray and abandon this country just like when you all betrayed and abandoned Naruto-kun, spoke the voice, where when they turned they saw a haggard and wounded Hinata standing behind them. Hinata's coat was covered in dirt and blood and was torn up a good bit, her fishnet top had several large holes as did her shinobi pants and she had several bruises and cuts on her arms, stomach and face. Hinata we have no choice, the Hokage orders were clear and we have to leave now if we don't we will all be killed and Kanoa needs us all if it hopes to stand a chance against Oto, Iwa, Kusa and the Hanya clan, answered Kakashi. You can go and run away and abandon Nami no Kuni Hataki-san, 
but I will not even if it cost me my life, replied Hinat harshly. Hanata, I can't let you do that, you're too important to Kanoa, staying here is suicide, pleaded Kakashi. Since he refused to abandon another comrade again he had already done it twice and refused to do it a third time. Besides he knew if he left Hanata here to die in Nami no Kuni, the Hyuga clan would rip him to shreds for abandoning their clan head, and that's if Suen didn't skin him alive first for letting her student get killed. He write Hyuga don't be a fool and throw your life away for this backwatered country it already lost, you're just letting your feeling for the dope control you, said Sasuke coldly since he thought Hanata was just being stupid. Maybe so Uchiha but it my decision and I will not abandon the land where Naruto-kun his grave is and where he is held as the hero that he was, said Hanata before she ran off to fight against the advancing Kiri Shinobis. Hanata, cried Kurani as she saw her former student run off and right towards a group of Kiri ninjas. Seeing this Kurani went after her and try and stop her but in her weakened condition Kurani could not get ahead of her. But she still kept going after Hanata to at least support her, Tenten also followed right behind Kurani to help support Hanata. Neji and Kakashi were also not far behind, since Neji wanted to try and protect his younger cousin from getting killed as did Kakashi. Since Hanata was too valuable to Kanoa to die here and besides he knew he could never face Naruto, if he could at all, in the next life if he let one of his few friends in Kanoa die. When Hanata attacked the four Kiri ninjas, she had been able to catch them by surprise where she was able to stab one of them in the side of the neck with her Kwani. She was then able to paralyze a Kiri Kunoiki by using her medical knowledge from studying under Suen by hitting her in her pressure points and paralyzing the Kunoiki body. Hanata then ducked under a kunai stab from the third Kiri Nin, where she the quickly used her medical knowledge again to hit the Kiri Nin in certain points in his neck. To stop his blood flow in his head from flowing down to the rest of his body, where all his blood stopped in his brain and killed within a minute or when the Kiri Nin fell to the ground to slowly die, Hanata was hit at the back of her leg with a kunai which caused her to fall on her knees. When she turned around she saw the fourth Kiri Shinobi behind her and who was about to cut her head off with his sword. But before he could, a sword blade suddenly came out of his chest, after which it came out and his body fell to the ground. When it did Hanata saw Tenten holding her Jian sword which had the Kiri Shinobi blood on it, behind her was Kurani, who then quickly ran over to Hanata to see if she was okay. Hanata, are you okay? I find Kurani sensei, spoke Hanata as she pulled the kunai out of her leg, after which Kurani quickly bandaged up her leg. Hanata we have to leave now before we are overrun, spoke Kakashi as he and Neji arrived. I told you, I not abandoning these people, said Hanata stubbornly, as she slowly got up. But before any of the others could reply to Hanata they suddenly heard some cry out. Izuna, rice rope, also the name of a white spirit wind, sea. After which a massive air vacuum appeared and blown the Kanoa ninjas away and at the same time small wind blades from the attack cut their bodies and covered them with cuts all over their bodies. The cuts did not bleed but they did hurt badly and prevented the Kanoa ninjas from being able to move. After the attack ended Kurani, Tenten and Hanata had somehow ended up being piled against one another, where they hit the side wooden wall of a nearby house, while Kakashi and Neji had been blown further back down the street. After the Kurani girls had regained their senses, Kurani suddenly heard a familiar male voice, one that she had hoped never hear again. When they looked up they saw none other than Isarugi Rajuta along with four Jonans behind him. Well, 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 Yuhi Sarutobi Kurani so lovely to see you again, sneered Rajuta, I had had hope that I would be the one to find you and it looks like I have the pleasure of meeting some of your other friends as well. After which Rajuta turned to Tenten, A-A-A-A-A-H-H-H-H, you must be the infamous Okami Ken no Kanoa, Kanoa Blade Mistress, you match the description that we have of you, since we never been able to get a photo of you. Although I never thought that you would turn out to be so lovely, spoke Rajuta as he eyed her lustfully. It's a shame I have to kill you, since we're not taking any chances with you Kanoa ninjas this time, such a waste, said Rajuta with a twisted smile as if finding the whole thing funny. I certain that my friend Udo Jinni will be quite angry at me for killing you, since he has been wanting the chance to kill for a long time. Just try it your bastard, snarled Tenten as she tried to stand up but fell down again due to her wounds and because of the poison still affecting her like Hanata and Kurani. At this Rajuta just laughed, all in good time my dear, all in good time, spoke Rajuta, after which he then turned to Hanata. 
and you must be the infamous Hyuga Shikyo no Megami, Hyuga's goddesses of death, although I find it hard to believe that someone like you can do the things I heard about you. Since even though you are a bloodline freak you're quite the exotic thing. I also heard the rumor that you never even been with a man, since the man you wanted was the QB Jinchuriki and since he dead and you won't let any other man touch you. Would you like me to end your virginity for you before you died I certain I can make it somewhat pleasant for you, said Rajuta. After which he went to cop a feel of Hanata's breasts, but before he could Hanata smacked it away. Don't you dare touch me, hissed Hanata angrily as she would sooner kill herself than let him try and rape her. Ah feisty I like that, I shame I can't break you and your friends, it would have been fun but unfortunately I have to kill you all, since I have a country to conquer and do not have the time for such pleasures, spoke Rajuta as he and his men drew out their swords. At which point they suddenly heard someone cry out, Hanata. When they looked to their left they saw Neji and Kakashi running over to them with Sasuke and Sakura just behind them. When they saw this Rajuta quickly ordered two of his men to intercept Kaskashi and the others and hold them off until he and the other two Kiri Jonans had dealt with Kurani and the girls. The two Jonan quickly acknowledged the order and engaged Kakashi and the others, who in their still weakened conditions due to the poison, they were barely able to hold their own against the two skilled and fresh Jonans. As Kakashi and the others fought against the two Kiri Nins, Rajuta turned his attention back onto Kurani, Hanata and Tenten. Well the ladies it's time to say goodbye, but don't worry your friends will be joining you very soon, you can be certain of that, spoke Rajuta where he and the other two Jonan raised their blades to end the girls' lives. At least now I can final join you Naruto-kun, I'm only sorry that I couldn't protect Wave like you would have wanted, thought Hanata as she closed her eyes. Be safe Haruzan, your father and I will be watching you from the next life, thought Kurani as she closed her eyes, accepting that she would now die. I guess this is it, thought Tenten sadly as she thought how her life was now about to end and how she would now leave her parents alone, and how the one regret she had was not to try and have a family which she had hoped to have later on in her life. A few meters away Kakashi and the others saw the swords descending down on Kurani and the others. Hanata, nnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnnn
at the same time when he looked at the rakage he felt a sort of powerful essence about him which made him and everyone around the rakage feel a combination of fear and respect for him although mainly fear. He remembered Sakura describing it to him and the feeling she felt, but yet her words did not do the feeling justice and could not help but hope and pray that the rakage was somehow on their side, otherwise they would be finished. So this is the infamous rakage that all the other great shinobi nations fear, thought Sasuke as he carefully analyzed the rakage, as he did he could not help, but shiver slightly like Kakashi as he felt the rakage immense power that was emanating from him. The rakage what the hell is he doing here, thought Rajuts with a slight panic, since like in Iwa with the Yondime Hokage, the Rokodime rakage was both feared and hated in Kiri although mainly feared. Rajuta himself had to admit that like most Kiri shinobis he greatly feared the rakage, which showed as both he and his all men subconsciously took a step or two back as they saw him looking directly at them. After a minute or so of just standing there and looking at Rajuta, the rakage turned slightly to Kureni, Hanata and Tenten, but looked directly at Kureni and spoke in a clam voice. We met again Kureni-san and it seems that once again my people and I have come to your rescue from Kiri. Kureni who was still slightly shocked at the rakage timely appearance, could only nod at her and say, hi. The rakage then put his hand into his right pocket and took out a small pill bottle and threw it to Kureni, who caught the bottle. Take one of the pills from the bottle and give the rest to your comrades and the wave defenders. The pills are the antidote to the poison that you all been infected with, they will take effect with a minute or so of taking them, spoke the rakage as he then turned to face Rajuta and his men. Isarugi Rajuta, you and your forces are to cease your attack on this village and your invasion of Nami no Kuni, wave country, which was illegal from the start and leave this country immediately. If you do not do this then you and your men will die here, spoke the rakage coldly. Gathering himself Rajuta stood forward, we do not take order from you, and our invasion of this country does not concern you, besides this is the way of the shinobi the weak fall and make way for the strong. Spoken like the idiotic barbarian that you are, just like your Mazukage, scoffed the Rakage. Your dare and salt are Mazukage, spoke Rajuta angrily as he was forgetting who he was dealing with, you will pay for insult as well as your crimes that you are guilty against Kiri and Mizu no Kuni water country. Crimes, answered the Rakage mockingly, before speaking again in a dangerous tone of voice. If there are anyone who are guilty of crimes it is you and your Mazukage. As well as that greedy cowardly fool the Daimyo of Mizu no Kuni, for your parts in the genocide of most bloodline holders in Kiri and Mizu no Kuni as well as the murder of countless innocent people. The extermination of those traitors and monsters was for the betterment and glory of Kiri and for Mizu no Kunai. Where it will rise to being the greatest power in the shinobi world as it should be, and on that glory's day we will march over the ruins your so-called heavenly alliance and of your village, said Rajuta angrily. If you think that will happen then you're more of a fool than I thought you were, replied the rakage simply. Enough of this it time for you to die, so that I can present your head to the Mizukage, attack him, shouted Rajuta as he ordered his men to attack, who at first did not move but after seeing the crazed look on Rajuta face they knew that if they did not he would kill them himself. Quickly the three Kiri Jonans surrounded the rakage believing that if they attacked him on all sides at once. The three Kiri Jonans quickly did several different hand seals where each of them then cried out a different jutsu. Sutan, Haran Bansho water style, stormy blockade cried the first Kiri Jonan, where he summoned a massive amount of water from the sky and have it crush the rakage. Sutan, Daibakufu no jutsu water style, great waterfall technique cried the second Kiri Jonan, where he summoned a strong column of water to attack the rakage. Sutan, Hahanru water style, tearing torrent cried the third Kiri Jonan, where he created water that spirals in his hand and fired at a high speed at the rakage. As the three attacks came in on three different sides the rakage stood perfectly still where he was and just when the attacks were only a few feet away, the rakage did a series of one-handed seals with incredible speed that made his hand look like a blur if people had tried to watch it. Just when the attacks were about to hit him the rakage finished his seals and called out. Mizu no Tatsumaki tornado of water. After which a massive water vortex appeared out the ground and surrounded the rakage. The water vortex acted as a shield to the rakage where it blocked the water attacks, after which the water vortex absorbed the water and the attacking power of the water attacks to become more powerful. After which the water vortex expanded outward and then exploded outward with incredible force, hitting the surrounding Kiri Jonans and sending them flying and crashing into different directions and through building walls and knocking them unconscious. 
Kakashi and Kureni and the others could not help but be amazed at how the Reikage so easily defeated the Kiri Jonans as if they were nothing more than Jonans with just a single jutsu and use it with such incredible force. Just as the Reikage defeated the three Kiri Jonans, Reijuta entered the fight and cried out. Matoi Izuna, wrapping wind spirit, F, after which Reijuta swung his sword downward to hit the ground, in which a massive wind blast attack surges from it and went towards the Reikage with great speed, where it tore up the ground as it traveled to him. As the attack speeded towards him the rakage did not move, letting the attack come closer towards him. When the attack was about hit him he quickly raised his hand with his palm stretched out forward and then cried out, Rai hate lightning wall. G. When the attack hit and massive explosion was caused, Rajuta grinned manically seeing this, thinking he had killed the rakage, but that disappeared quickly. When the smoke dissipated and he saw the rakage, with his hand still stretched out and was behind a large wall of electricity. When the Kanoa team and the wave defenders saw this they were shocked at how the Rakage had so effortless stopped the attack as if it was nothing. Is that it, said the Rakage mockingly as he lowered his hand and the electric maid wall dissipated, since if it is, then you may as well leave now while you still have a chance. Rajuta just growled after hearing this, and before he could even reply seven people suddenly appear right beside the Rakage. Kureni and Sakura quickly recognized the four of them as the Rakage bodyguards, Yugito, Yotsuki Killer B, Fu and Okatsu. The other three were clearly members of Storm, since their masks were blue and black, although they were clearly not the same ones that they met at the hold since they had different masks shaped like a leopard, a baku and a dragon. Yo boss, you okay? We saw the explosion and thought you might be in trouble, spoke Killer B. I fine B, thank you, replied the Rakage. Would you like one of us to finish him off Rakage sama asked Leopard who seemed to be the leader and was look at Rajuta, who in turn got nervous at the arrival of Killer B and the Rakage other bodyguards as well as the Storm Nins. No, all of you are to go to them and stay out of it I will finish this myself, spoke the Rakage as he pointed at the Kanoa group and then stepped forward to face Rajuta by himself. While Killer B and the others went over to the Kanoa group, who had now just recovered from the poison, thanks to the antidote that the Rakage gave Kureni, who in turn passed it out to the others and the wave defenders. So you rather fight me yourself than have your men do it, does that mean that you recognize my strength and that I would be too much for them? Sneered Rajuta arrogantly. Hardly, any one of my people there would have be too much for you to handle and could defeat you, the only reason why I told them to stay back was because, I prefer to finish what I have started, even if it's dealing with trash like you, answered the rakage which enraged Rajuta at the rakage insult. We see about that, for you have yet to see my deadliest technique, cried Rajuta before he swung his sword again and cried out. Tobi Izuna, jump wind spirit, H. When Rajuta swung his blade, a crescent-shaped air vacuum blade came from it at amazing speed, but when the crescent-shaped blade hit the rakage it just passed right through him, much to the shock of Rajuta, the Kanoa team and the wave defenders. After a few seconds the rakage began to shimmer and then fade away showing it was not the real rakage. It seems that your deadliest technique is as unimpressive as your other techniques, the standards of the great swordsmen of the mist must have indeed fallen very low to allow someone like you become a member of it, spoke the rakage who appeared to the left of Rajuta. But how, did he use some kind of bunshin clone, asked Kureni out loud. No it wasn't a bunshin, answered Yugito who was standing near the Kanoa group like the rest of her group and heard her. It was a Zanzo after image. I, a Zanzo, asked Sakura. Yes, a Zanzo is an old technique that the Rakage learned that was used by the first few ninjas when the first shinobi clans were forming. To do the technique a person has to be extremely fast to do it. The technique involves a user moving an incredible high speed from one place to the other. Where they are so fast that most people's eyes cannot keep up with the user and where the user leaves an after image of the himself or herself, where it takes a few seconds for the image of the user to disappear and for the people's eyes to realize that the person is gone. Although the learning of the technique became outdated when Bunshans were created, the few that know it in a certain aspect today only learned it by accident after training very hard in Taijutsu and speed, spoke Fu. This of course surprised the Kanoa team at how the Rakage knew an ancient technique like that, although it did make sense. Since both Guy and Lee were able to do the technique in a certain aspect, but still nowhere near like the Rakage was able to do it. Quickly turning around the enraged Rajuta fired another Tobi Izuna at the Rakage, where it simply passed right through him again revealing one again that it was not the real the Rakage but an after image. 
This continued for several minutes where Rajuta would fire a Tobi Izuna at the rakage, but it would just pass through his after image and he would appear in a different position. As this happened, Rajuta was becoming more and more infuriated at how he kept missing the rakage and how the rakage was humiliating him by making look like a fool. He began to fire rapid amounts of Tobi Izuna at the rakage, but kept missing until the rakage appeared at the other end of the street behind Rajuta and Rajuta fired three Tobi Izuna blades at him. The rakage was able to sidestep two of them but was slightly too slow, where the last one cut the sleeve of his coat. When Rajuta saw that he had cut the rakage he grinned widely. Did you see that, said Rajuta grinning, my Tobi Izuna was able to cut you and proves that it is the ultimate killing technique. Does it make you happy? Asked the rakage. What? Asked a confused rajuta. Does this little cut on my coat, make you happy? Asked the rakage. Even after all the attacks that you threw at me, all of them missed. While that last one just made a small cut on my coat, it didn't even cut my skin. You even claim that your technique is the ultimate killing technique yet other than this cut on my sleeve, you haven't killed me nor have you hit me even once. At this Rajuta became even angrier at the rakage comment. Damn you and your pathetic excuses, growled Rawat as he got ready to make another attack. I've grow tired of this fight little fight, it time to end this, spoke the rakage dully as he then reached to his side to take something off the belt of his jeans. At the same moment Rajuta swung his sword again and cried out, Toby Izuna. This is the end for you, you bastard, cried Rajuta after he unleashed a massive Toby Izuna which was larger than any of the previous Toby Izuna. Just as the massive crescent shape air vacuum blade came towards him, the rakage quickly took out a blue sword hilt, where a yellow lightning bolt shaped blade quickly shot out of the hilt. He then quickly raised the sword up to meet the attack. When he raised his sword up, he slashed at the attack, just as it was about to hit him and cut the attack in two, where the remains of the vacuum air passed harmlessly by him. What? cried Rajuta as he could not believe that his strongest and fastest attack had been cut in two and was defeated so easily. He was not alone, since many of the Kanoa Nins were equally surprised at how the rakage defeated Rajuta's attack. But what really shocked them the most was that they knew the sword that the rakage had in his hand. The sword he had was the Nadaim Hokage's sword, the Rajan no Kent the sword of the Thunder God Six, which had been stolen by a former Kanoa ninja, Aoi Rokusho who turned traitor and joined Omega Court the village hidden in the rain. The Rajan. Where on earth did the rakage find it? The last sighting of it was with Aoi, when he fought against Naruto, Sasuke and Sakura. During the Todoroki Shrine race in Cha no Kuni T country 10 years ago, and both he and the Rajan were lost when they fell off a cliff, it was thought to be lost. But the blade is different from what it was supposed to be, since it now shaped like a like a lightning block thought Kakashi as he was completely stunned. The Rajan. Impossible that sword was lost years ago, cried Rajuta in disbelief. Well clearly it no longer is, since as you can see I have it and I can use it ways that the Kanoa's Nadaim Hokage could only dream about, spoke the Rakage. But still it is time to end this fight, said the Rakage as he then deactivated the Rajan and placing it back on his belt, and I will do it without using the Rajan, since I do not need it to defeat the likes of you. We see about that, shouted Rajuta as he charged forward at the rakage with his sword. As Rajuta charged forward, the rakage then did a few one-handed hand seals and brought his hand up with his the palm of his hand forward and then cried out, K's no to me, wind of pain, J. After which a massive vortex of wind came from his hand and headed right for Rajuta, who could no dodge in time, and was hit full force by the attack and was slashed all over his body by small the wind blades of the attack. He was then sent flying into to the air and out of the village. After defeating Rajuta, the rakage turned over to his teams as well as the Kanoa team and wave defenders who had all recovered from the effects of the poison. The rakage then walked over and faced the Kanoa group, while Killer B and the girls as well as the other storm nins went and stood behind him, after which the rakage then spoke. It seems that it becoming a habit of lately that my shinobis and I are coming to save Kanoa ninjas, considering the events of the past month, spoke the rakage. And if I may, I, am guessing that the reason as to why you are here helping to defend Nami no Kuni. Is to prevent Kiri from using Nami no Kuni as a staging point to open a new front against Kanoa from your rear, since from what I understand Nami no Kuni cut all ties with your village 10 years ago. That is correct Rakage Denka, but not to sound ungrateful for your aid against Rajuta and his men as well as for saving Kurani and the other, for we are. 
but why are you and your shinobis here? Nami no Kuni is not an ally or a member of Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance. I afraid that your questions will have to wait till later, since if you have not forgotten we are in the middle of a battle, one that Kiri is on the verge of whining if we do not drive them out now, said the Rakage. Which Kakashi agreed since he knew the Rakage was right and that his questions could be answered later, since they had a battle to fight and with the Rakage and his shinobi on their side Kakashi knew they might just stand a chance of whining it. At that moment another storm nin suddenly appeared on his knees next to the rakage with a blue and black color mask and shaped like a panther. Rakage Sama. Yes. What is it panther? Asked the rakage. Teams 22, 16 and 12 have arrived and ready to engage the Kiri forces. Good. Have team 16, engage the Kiri forces on the southern part of the village, have team 12 engage the Kiri forces on the eastern part of the village and have team 22 engage the Kiri forces on the western part of the village. While we engage the Kiri forces on this part of the village and drive them back. Also have our teams give out the antidote to the other Kanoa teams and wave defenders that are affected by the poison and have our combat medics assist the wounded, order the rakage where Bear quickly saluted and went to give out the rakage orders to the other teams. Now if you excuse us we have a country to save, said the rakage as he and the rest of his group were off to engage the Kiri forces. Not wanting to be outdone the Kanoa group and the Wave Samurai and Militia members followed after the Rakage and his group to do their part. The southern part of the village in the southern part of the village the defense line was on the verge of collapse, most of the Wave defenders were dead, wounded or unable to move due to the poison. Kiba and Akamaru were on the ground as their bodies could not move due to the poison and the wounds that they had suffered from trying to fight on after they were affected by the poison. Mogi and Udon were on the ground next to them and were struggled to try and get up but could not. The only ones that seemed to be still able to fight were Guy, Lee and Konohamaru, who were desperately trying to fight off the large numbers of oncoming Kiri Nins and defend their comrades. But unfortunately in their weakened condition and against the ever-growing numbers of oncoming Kiri Ninjas they were losing grounds quickly. Just when they were about to be overwhelmed an unknown voice suddenly shouted out, Futon, Mugen Sajin Daytopa, wind style, infinite sand cloud great breakthrough. After which a massive blast of wind and sand, hit the advancing Kiri Shinobis, blinding many, seven, from the sand and blowing away others into stone house walls knocking them out. After the wind and sand blast dissipated, another voice shouted out Koten, Kutetsu no Toge, steel style, steel spikes K and dozens of small metal spikes appeared out of the ground and impaled most of the Kiri Nins that were blinded by the wind and sand attack. And before the few remaining Kiri Nins that were still alive or conscious could do anything they were pounced on by a large lion and were ripped to shreds by it. When it was done the lion quickly morphed into a man wearing Anbu-like armor and clothing as well as a blue and black mask shaped like a lion. He was then joined by three more Anbu with similar outfits and masks although their shapes were different where, one was in the shape of a chimera another was shaped like a fox and the third was shaped like a raccoon. Who are you? asked Guy who although knew they were Anbu judging by their uniform but was unfamiliar with the mask design. Before any of them could answer Guy's question, Lee suddenly spoke up and answered for them. They are from Kumo, and they are members of the youthful storm division of Kumo, the same youthful group that saved Sakura-chan, Choji-san, Kureni-san and I from the hold. This of course surprised Guy, Konohamaru and the others. Kumo. But why are you doing here Nami no Kuni isn't a member or an ally of the Heavenly Alliance, spoke Konohamaru. We are here simply to help and because the Rakage wishes to help this country and has come her personally to help its people and we of Storm go wherever our cage goes and that is all you need to know for now, replied Chimera. The Rakage is here himself, asked Guy in disbelief that a cage would leave his village to defend this country that has no ties to his village. To which Chimera just nodded and that it was true. Here takes these you will need them, spoke Raccoon as she threw Guy a pill bottle, who caught it, after which she then went over and started to heal a wounded wave samurai. What is it? asked Guy. It is the antidote to the poison that the Kiri Nins used, the poison was given to them by Kusugaku, our spies there were able to get a sample of it as well as a few others and created antidote for it. It should work it in a few minutes after taking it, replied Fox which of course surprised the Kanoa Ninja at how prepared the Kumo Ninjas were. How do we know it not some other kind of poison that will kill us or knock us out if we take it, spoke Kiba as he wasn't exactly sure that they that they could trust them. Don't not say such unyouthful things Kiba-kun the ninjas of Storm are honorable and youthful shinobis, besides if they wish to kill us they could have already done so. 
Since they are highly skilled and powerful shinobis and would not need such tricks special in our weakened condition, answered Lee. After which he then took a pill from the bottle and swallowed it. Thank you Lee San, we have also heard much about your skill and power from our commander Falcon from the raid on the hold, he holds you in high regard as does Captain Hawk, said Chimera. What was that jutsu that you guess used that caused those metal spike to come out of the ground, I've never seen anything like that, asked Konohamaru after he swallowed the pill he was given. The jutsu was a jutsu that I can use thanks to my clan bloodline, answered Fox. But that impossible the only bloodline that could use jutsus involving metal was the Tatara clan, thanks to their coat and steel release bloodline. And they disappeared right before the founding of the great shinobi villages, they were thought to be extinct long ago, said Guy in disbelief. That was something we wanted the world to believe, since we went into hiding in the mountain ranges of Kaminari no Kuni, Lightning Country, and lived there until we were discovered when the civil war started and we joined the rebel factions. Now we are proud members of Kumogaku, replied Fox, shocking the Kanoa team. And that jutsu you used, it was like what Gara-kun can use, when he uses sand manipulating jutsu, spoke Lee. That was correct, I can use Sabutan, sand release, much like the god I'm Kazekage and all other previous Ichibi no Shukaku, one-tailed Shukaku host. Although I cannot use it on their level since my clan were the original guardians of the Ichibi no Shukaku spirit, until we were wrongfully accused of treason by the Yondime Kazekage and were forced to flee where we eventually joined Kumo. I can do Sabutan thanks to special hide in jutsu that my clan created based on the abilities of the Ichibi no Shukaku, one-tailed Shukaku hosts, replied Chimera. And that changing into a lion trick, since it was like no henge I ever seen, said Kiba who was now starting to regain his control and feeling into his body thanks to the antidote that they were given by the Storm Nins. No it wasn't I simply transformed into one, since I, am from the Shihoin clan, answered Lion. This got a confused look from the younger Kanoa members, but an understanding look from the guy. Yes I see, that makes sense now, replied Guy. Sensei, asked Lee. There are stories that I have heard, where in Kumo there lives a clan called the Shihoin clan that has the a bloodline that allows them to literally transform into a certain type of animal that matches their personality. I heard of them but I have never met one until now, they are even said to be one of the three great founding clans of Kumo much like how the Uchihas and the Senju clans were Kanoa's great founding clans, answered Guy. This of course surprised Kiba and the others at such a clan existing. You are well informed Guy San, but I believe that we no longer have any more time for talking, spoke Fox as he pointed out to the large number of Kiri Nins coming towards them. Yes of course we cannot let these unyouthful shinobi damper our flames of you, cried Guy. High and before this battle over I shall defeat 50 more Kiri Ninja and if I cannot do that I shall swim to Mizu no Kuni and back with just one hand, cried Lee. Yosh. The flames of youth burn brightly in you my beautiful student and I shall help you achieve your goal. Where if you should fail I shall run around Kanoa 1000 times with just my hands, cried Guy after which he and Lee charged forward crying out youth. At this the storm's nins just had large sweat drops at the back of their heads. Man, they're just as crazy and weird as I heard, dot but still he can't help but kind of like them, thought Fox with a slight smile behind his mask, where he and the other storm's nins ran forward to help Guy and Lee. They were then soon followed by Konohamaru and the others, as well as the wave defenders who had recovered from the poison and now wanted in on the action and drive Kiri out of their country. Western part of the village on the eastern part of the village, Yamato was wounded and leaning against a wall with Shino who was unable to move, since he had gotten a heavy dose of the poison and his Kikaichu were busy trying to get rid of the poison, but this still left him numb and unable to move. Sai was struggling to hold off a Kiri Jonin that he was fighting against with his two Tantos. Tiger, Wolf and Bird were also busy fighting off several Kiri Nins with a few remaining samurai who were still able to fight, and were trying to protect Tazuna and the other men, who were down due to either the poison or the wounds they got from fighting. As Sai was blocking several strikes from a Jonin swordsman, the swordsman was able to knock one of his Tantos from his hands. After which he then threw a pepper bomb into his eyes, temporarily blinding him for a few seconds, giving the Jonin the opening he needed where he knocked Sai to the ground, when Sai started seeing again he quickly saw the Kiri Jonan stand over with his sword ready to stab him. But just when the swordsman was about to kill him, Sai suddenly heard a female voice cry out, Tentai, Celestial Arrow, L, and an arrow made out of chakra pierced the Jonan in the chest from the back killing him. 
At the same time several Ikiri Nins who were about to fire their kunai launchers on Tiger, Wolf and Bird who had just fought off their opponents from a nearby rooftop. Suddenly found themselves surrounded by hundreds of flowers that seemed to grow from the roof floor and around them. After which a male voice cried out, Kubatan, chica plant style, scattered flowers, M, where thousands of flower petals started swell around them with great speed and created a spiral sphere that surrounded them on all side. When the Kirinins tired to get out the flower's petal cut them like small tiny blades, after which the sphere started to collapse on itself, where it got smaller and smaller until the Kirinins had no room left and cut to pieces where their screams of horror and pain were heard by all around them. When the attack ended all that remained of the Kiri Nins was the shredded clothing, pools of blood and small tiny chucks of meat. When Sai and the others looked up they saw two storm nins standing on the rooftops, where one who was clearly female by the shape of her body and was wearing a snake anbu mask was holding a bow and arrow made out chakra in her hand. The other next to her who wore a frog-shaped anbu mask had his hands stretched out and had the remaining flowers fall back into the ground. Who the hell are those guys? asked Tiger. I believe that they're storm nins from Kumo, the same group that saved my sensei Kureni and the rest of her team from the hold, answered Shino who was just as surprised as the others but was able to hide it better than the others. What is Kumo doing here? This fight doesn't concern him, spoke Bird. Better yet what kind of jutsu did that guy use? Was it Mokuten would release? asked Wolf. No it wasn't Mokuten, spoke Yamato as he held his bleeding side. I have heard legends about a clan existing in Kumo that had a special bloodline called Kubaten plant release which is similar in some aspects to Mokuten. The clan is called the Kuchiki clan and only a few members of the clan possess the bloodline, it even said that the Kuchiki clan are one of the five founding clans of Kumo much like how the Uchiha and Senju clans are Kanoas. But what about the other one with the bow and arrow made out of chakra, asked Sai. I don't know I never heard of a bloodline or a clan technique like that before, replied Yamato since he was just as curious as the others were about the female storm nin technique. That is no concern to any of you about my techniques Yamato-san, but you are correct about my partner bloodline and him being a member of the Kuchiki clan and it being similar to your Mokuten power, replied Snake when she and her partner appeared in front of the Kanoa team, and at the same time surprising Yamato about how she knew his name. Why is Kumogaku here this battle? Since it does not involve you or your alliance and how is it that you know Yamato-san name, asked Shino. We are here because the Rakage has ordered us to and because we of Storm always follow our cage's orders and follow him wherever he goes and as for how we know who Yamato-san name is a trade secret, replied Frog. You mean the Rakage is here, asked a surprised wolf, where the two Storm Nins just nodded. After which two more male Storm Nins arrived one wearing a monkey mask and the other wearing a dog mask. Dog, have you and Monkey handed out the antidote to those affected in the center part of the village? asked Snake. Yes we have, replied Dog. You have an antidote to this poison? asked Tazuna who had now joined the conversation. Yes we have and here's some for all of you, it should take effect within minutes of taking it, spoke Dog handing out the antidote. Also I sent out my hawk, to give an airily view of the situation and from the looks of things there is about 30 Kiri Nins coming this way and will be on use in a few minutes so we should be ready for them, said Monkey. Before the Kanoa group and wave defenders could ask what hawk they got their answer when a large hawk suddenly swooped down on them and landed on Monkey back where it seemed merged with his back. What the hell was that? asked Bird in complete surprise and shock. But before Monkey could reply, Sai answered for him. You're from the Ning clan. The Ning clan? asked a confused Tazuna who was just as surprised as the others were. They are a clan of shinobis that used to live in Kirigaku, but fled it just when the bloodline crusades began in it. From what I have heard they fled it because they feared that their clan's hide in jutsu's secret techniques would be mistaken as bloodlines and be wiped out like some of the other bloodline clans there. Their technique works on a similar manner as my Sumi Jutsu's ink techniques but unlike mine they use tattoos of animals that they paint on their bodies and summons them off their skin to fight. They even can control what the animals do and can see what they can see even in great distances, also the animals will return to them when they call them back or if they are destroyed instead of just being destroyed, answered Sai. Since he had heard of the clan and he had based his Sumi Jutsu on the clan techniques. Now that we have introduced ourselves I believe we should get ready for the 30 Kiri Shinobi that are heading this way, said Snake. 
Snake is correct, Dog you help heal the wounded while we engage the Kiri forces, spoke Frog after which he turned to Yamato and Tazuna, once you all have gotten over the poison we will need you to help us. Tazuna-san we will need you samurai to help us fight the Kiri shinobis while you and your volunteers help Snake give us long rang support. Yamato-san we will need you and your people to help us in the wave samurai battle against the Kiri shinobis once you are ready. Both men nodded in agreement, where the storm nins hide in some of the empty builds and ambush the Kiri nins when the pass through them. After which the Kanoa nins and the wave defenders quickly joined the storm nins in the fight and together they started to push the Kiri forces back. Eastern part of the village at the eastern part of the village Shikiyamaru was currently trying to think of a situation that could help them, both Ino and himself were in no real condition to fight thanks to inhaling a large amount of poison. Joji and Inari were desperately trying to hold back several attacking Kiri Nins in their weakened and wounded conditions along with a few wave samurai who were in just as bad if not worse condition as they were in. Badger was dead where a Kiri Nin was able to sneak up behind him and stab him in the back of his head. While Ball was on the ground bleeding from some wounds he had received from fighting a Kiri Nin and the remaining wave defenders were in a similar state whether they were wounded or affected by the poison. After seeing this and fully analyzing the situation Shikiyamaru knew there were only two possible outcomes, both which resulted in Kiri whining and taking Nami no Kuni. The first options would be them being all slaughtered or taken as prisoners by Kiri. While the other would be them trying to break out of the village, where many of them may die from the attempt due to their weakened condition and retreat back across the Great Naruto Bridge, and back to Kanoa Lines. While leaving Inari at his men in the village to be slaughtered by the Kiri Shinobis, since they would be unable to keep up with the Kanoa Shinobis and would just slow them down. Just when Shikiyamaru thought they were all finished, he and the others suddenly heard a female voice cry out, Kuchio's no jutsu, Ukamida, summoning technique, wolf pack, and the next thing he saw were a dozen of black, white and grey wolves coming out nowhere and attacking the unsuspecting Kiri Nins and ripping the two apart. As this was happening two Kiri Nins suddenly appeared right behind Choji and Inari who were too busy watching what has happening to notice them. Before Shikiyamaru could yell out and warn them another shinobi wearing anbu armor and a blue and black mask shaped like a cat suddenly appeared right out of a wall. That was behind the two Kiri Nins like he was some kind of ghost and the stabbed the two Kiri Nins in the back of the head without either of them know whatever happened. When Shikiyamaru saw the mask and the outfit he quickly realized that the one that had saved Choji and Inari was a storm ninja from Kumo, since the outfit and the mask matched the description of the ones that Choji told him about. He then saw another one appeared and started to fight the remaining four Kiri Nins hand to hand where she ducked a stabbing strike from a Kiri Nin, the female ninja then punched the Kiri right in the stomach and with such force that it caused the Kiri Nin to collapse on the ground unconscious for the pain of the punch. After which the female Storm Nin quickly did a backwards flip over a Kiri swordsman to avoid a slashing strike from the Kiri swordswoman that tried to slash her from behind. As the female Storm Nin was in midair she kicked the swordswoman on the back of her head and sent her flying into a nearly wall head first, showing that the female Storm Nin was very, very strong. She then quickly blocked another kunai with her own kunai that she took out and pushed the Kiri Nin back after which, she bended backwards to avoid it another kunai that sent at her from a Kiri Nin who fired it with his kunai launcher. Reacting quickly the female Storm Nin straightened herself up, and threw several shurikens at the Kiri Nin. She then quickly sidestepped the Kiri she fought earlier and had tried to attack her again where she knocked his feet away with a kick making him fall backwards and before he hit the ground, she kicked him in the back up to the air before jumping up to him herself and then shouting out Tendu Heaven's Kick. Oh, and doing a falling axe kick, sending the Kiri Nin flying down into the ground before he could do anything to block it, and creating a large crater in the street with him in it. But as the female Storm Nin was in midair she was then hit several kunais in the chest and stomach by the Kiri Nin with the kunai launcher. But as soon as the kunai hit her, she turned into a broken slab of stone with several kunai it in revealing that the femal storm nin used a kawarimi no jutsu body replacement technique. When the kiri nin saw this he tired to move away to another position, but as he turned around he saw the female storm nin standing right behind him and punching him right in the face. Where he was sent fly right through the wall of a building that was opposite him, once again showing that the female storm nin was quite strong. After the Kiri Nins were defended another Storm Nin arrived and quickly went over to the wounded wave defenders and began to heal them while at the same time giving the Kanoa Nins as well as the others who were just affected by the poison the antidote to it. 
Soon enough the Kanoa teams along with the remaining wave defenders who weren't too badly wounded had fully recovered from the poison. It was then that they got a better look at their saviors. The one that saved Choji and Inari wore a standard Anbu outfit with blue and black mask like all the others but his was shaped like a cat. The one that gave them the antidote to the poison and was helping healing the wounded wore a bull-shaped mask. The one who fought and defeated the Kiri Nins wore an eagle-shaped mask, while the one who seemingly summoned the wolves to attack those Kiri Nins earlier was the one who wore the demon-shaped mask. Who the hell are you guys? asked Dino since although she was happy that they saved them, but like most women she was naturally curious and wanted to know what was going on and who they were. But before any of the could answer Shikiyamaru answered for them, troublesome, don't you remember the group that saved Choji, Kuranai and the others from the hold and how Choji described them to us? They're from Kumo and are from the Storm Division, right Choji? Which Choji nodded to, yeah they're from Storm, but they're not the same ones that saved the others and I from the hold. If you're from Kumo then what are you doing here, this battle does not concern you, said Bo rather rudely. Even despite the fact that the strong Nin saved him and the others and healed him of his wounds and the poison. We have no obligation to answer you Kanoa Nin, so we will not, all we will say is that we storm Nins go wherever our cage tells us to go and follow him wherever he goes, replied Eagle. What do you mean by follow your cage wherever he goes? asked Dino until she suddenly realized, you can't mean that the rakage here, she cried in disbelief. You are indeed correct he is indeed here, but before you ask why he is here himself, that is of no concern to you, spoke Cat before any of them could ask. Fine then, but tell us was that ability you used to pass through the wall like it wasn't even there a bloodline ability, since I pretty certain that it wasn't a jutsu since I didn't sense any chakra when you came through the wall, said Shikiyamaru. If Shikiyamaru had been able to see through Cat Mask he would have seen him smirk as she was impressed with the young Nara. It seems that our profile on you was right on the money with you Nara Shikiyamaru of the Nara clan and John and strategic commander of Kanoa. Troublesome, you have a file on me don't you? Of course we would be fools not to, we have files on all of you as well as all your shinobis, since as the great Sun Tzu's in the art of war said, no your enemy, replied Eagle. But we aren't your enemy, replied Choji, not yet, but maybe later on and besides we aren't allies either, but for now we are on the same side and we will fight with you against our common enemy. Fine, but you still haven't answered my question was that ability where you passed through the wall of bloodline, asked Shikiyamaru. Yes, but that impossible there no bloodline that exists that allows people to pass through things, said Ino in disbelief. You forget Yamanaka-san in the shinobi world nothing is impossible and besides, all warfare is based on deception, said Bull. This of course caused Ino to huff in an ounce, since as an interrogator she didn't like being denied what she wanted to know from people. If you guys don't mind stop playing 20 question my men and I would really appreciate you helping us fight off the Kiri Nins that are advancing towards us, spoke Inari with a hit of annoyance. As he then pointed to the large number of Kiri Nins coming towards them on the rooftops and the street. Inari-san is correct we have an enemy to defeat so I suggest we get to it, spoke Kat, where Shikiyamaru nodded in agreement. After which the wave defenders, the Kanoa Nins and the Storm Nins all lined up into formation and charged forward. With the arrival of the rakage, his bodyguards and the storm's nins the battle began to shift in favor of the defenders, where the Kiri forces were being slowly driven back with heavy losses on the four sides of the village. Northern part of the village as the battle raged in the northern part of the village Sakura was healing a wounded Kakashi, where he had been badly injured by a Kiri Jonin who was able to stab Kakashi with his kunai just before Kakashi rammed his Chidori into the Jonin. As Sakura was healing Kakashi she could not help notice how the Storm Nins and the the Rakage as well as his bodyguards fought their opponents. When they turned slightly to her left she saw Dragon fighting three Kiri Jonans after flipping backwards to avoid a sword slash from a Kiri Jonan. Dragon quickly then went into a horse stance, after which he then released a large amount of chakra, where much to the shock of Sakura and the Kiri Nins, bat-like wings suddenly appeared out of his back and he started to flap them, where he then began to fly. So he is from Yun clan, I didn't any of them became Kumo ninjas anymore, spoke Kakashi with mild surprise. The Yun clan. Who are they Kakashi sensei I never heard of them? Asked Sakura. I'm not surprised you haven't heard of them, they are not your typical shinobi clan, since unlike most shinobi clans the Yun clan are the guardian protectors of the lightning daimyo family. 
They have guarded and protected the Satic royal family since the founding of the village, since the clan sworn an oath to protect and serve only Satic family after the family saved the Yun clan from being wiped out by its enemies. Hence why not many of their members become Kumo ninja, since they normally only serve and protect of the lightning daimyo. Not to mention the fact they fight more like samurai than ninja most of the times, replied Kakashi. But how does he have those wings? asked Sakura who was still staring at Dragon with surprise. It because of their bloodline, answered Kakashi. Bloodline. Yes the Yun clan is one of five Kaminari no Kuni, lightning country, only shinobi clans with bloodlines, their bloodline is called Riot and Dragon Release. It gives them increased strength, speed and power as well as to be able to transform into humanoid-like dragons increasing their power exponentially it's even rumored that they have a summoning contract for dragons as well. It is also said that they are the strongest shinobi clan in Kaminari no Kuni, said Kakashi which surprised Sakura. As Kakashi and Sakura watched the battle, Dragon quickly did a few hand seals and the cried out, Haiden, Go and Ryuga, Secret Art, Ultimate Dragon Fang Blaze P. After which Dragon then inhaled a large amount of air and then exhales a massive long wide stream of super hot fire that took the shape of a dragon with incredible speed from his mouth through the hole in his mask mouth and streamed towards the Kiri Nins like a flamethrower. The attack came in so fast and the brightness of the fire attack was so bright that it blinded the ninjas for a second or two and were hit by the attack. When the attack ended all that remained of the Kiri Jonans was their charred crispy remains. After dealing with the Kiri Jonans dragon then took out a katana that he had on his back and began to attack several Kiri Nins who were on the rooftops from the air with his katana. As Dragon went to deal with the Kiri Nins on the rooftops, Sakura and Kakashi then saw Baku fighting with six Kiri Chunans after dodging a kunai throw. Baku quickly rolled up his sleeve to reveal a summoning seal on his arm and after biting his thumb he spread some blood on it to summon large Kusaragama-like weapons, each with two sickle blades, the blades were connected to a spiked rod tethered together by a long chain. After summoning the weapons he used them to block several attacks from the attacking Kiri Nins. After blocking a sword strike with one of the blades he brought the other to the side of the Kiri Nin, who could not avoid the attack and was cut in two with his upper half cut from his lower half. Baku was able to do this by channeling his wind chakra to the blades of weapons to enhance the cutting power of them. As soon as he killed one of the Kiri Nins, Baku quickly swirled around to block several kunais that were fired at him from behind and by a Kiri Nin with a kunai launcher. After blocking the kunais he quickly threw one of his weapons at the Kiri Nin, as he threw it the bladed portion of the weapon began to spin like a fan. The Kiri Nin quickly sidestepped the attack and was about to take aim and fire again, when something happened that he did not expect to happen. Baku pulled on the chain and cased it to come back, since unknown to the Kiri Nin Baku was able to control the Kusaragama-like weapons from a range, by using the chain and was extremely proficient in wielding them, both when he throws them and when in his hands. When the weapons came back the unsuspecting Kiri Nin was cut in two just like the earlier Kiri Nin. After regaining his other weapon Baku quickly began to defend himself from the remaining four Kiri Nin's attacks and despite being outnumbered he was able to hold his ground well. After a few minutes Baku was able to get the Kiri Nin's at a distance by throwing his weapons around, and using the chains to move them at unpredictable paths so that they would have to keep dodging his attacks. When he regained both his weapons again he quickly channeled his wind chakra to the blades and the swung them down and yelled out, Kazushini, wind death Q. After which a massive gust of wind was shot at the Kiri Nins and dozens of large crescent-shaped wind blades were fired along with it, where the wind blades cut the four Kiri Nins to pieces. When the Kiri Nins were dealt with Baku then went over to Tenten and Neji were fighting against some Kiri Nins. After that, Sakura continued to finish healing Kakashi as she did she also saw Leopard to her left on her knees busy healing a wounded wave militia who was on the ground. It was then that Sakura and Kakashi saw a large bulky build Kiri Nin who looked to be very muscular and was about 6 foot high coming up behind her. Sakura and Kakashi were both about to shout and warn Leopard, who seemed to be too busy healing the wounded militia man to notice the Kiri Nin behind her. But before either of them could, Leopard suddenly twirled around as she was crouched down and quickly slashed at the back of the Kiri Nin leg and used her Chakura no Mesu, Chakra Scalpel, to sever the nerves at the back joint of his right leg, causing him to fall forward and onto his knees. As the Kiri Nin tired to get up he just fell down onto the ground, after falling to the ground the Kiri Nin used his other still good light to push himself forward and tired to attack Leopard. But Leopard just sidestep him and the Kiri Nin just fell forward, 
where Leopard then quickly grabbed the Kirinin good leg and twisted it around and the pulling it backwards breaking it in a dozen different places causing the Kirinin to scream in pain. Leopard then let go of the Kirinin leg and she then flipped herself backwards where she landed both her knees bones on the Kirinin upper back hard and breaking it in several places when that happened the Kirinin scream out in agony. When Leopard went to move away and go back to the wounded militia man the Kirinin somehow grabbed onto the back of Leopard left leg and tired stop her and pull her back to him. But Leopard quickly just moved her leg back so that the Kirinin hand was between both her legs and then in one quickly hard motion twisted her legs so that she would snap the Kirinin's wrist, once again causing the man agonizing pain and walking away. During the fight Kakashi and Sakura were so focused watching Leopard deal with the large Kirinin that they failed to notice another Kirinin sneaking up behind them. Just as the Kirinin was about to swing his sword down and cut both their heads off with it, another voice shouted out, Surarai Thunder Slash, R, and crescent-shaped flying blade of energy came out of nowhere and cut the Kirinin head off. When Kakashi and Sakura turned around they saw the head of the Kirinin fall to the ground and his headless body falling to the ground after it. When they looked around to whom had saved them, they saw the rakage standing nearby hold the region. First rule of being a shinobi always watch your surroundings, or else next time you won't be saved by me, said the rakage before disappearing in a flash. After that Sakura quickly healed Kakashi and then the both of them went to help in the battle. As the battles continued the Kirinins were being pushed back further and further, during the battle Panther face of against two Kirinins on a rude top where they each quickly did hand seals and each cried out. Sutan, ya no kuchi, water style, snake's mouth, cried the first Kirinin and calling on the water from a nearby well to form a giant snake mouth. Sutan, Mazurapa, water style, violent water wave, cried the second Kirinin and gushed out a large amount of water from the mouth like a waterfall towards Panther. Quickly doing a few seals, Panther quickly cried out, Raten Regeki no Yoroi, lightning style, lightning strike armor, and covered himself in lightning like an armor. The two separate attacks both reached him at the same time, when the two attacks hit him they pushed him back and tore up the tiles on the rooftop but fortunately Panther was able to withstand the two attacks and keep himself standing up. When the attacks ended Panther armor left deactivated, since it were only good for one hit, which was why it was lucky that the two attacks hit at the same time. After the Regeki no Yoroi deactivated Panther quickly did another set of seals and cried out, Ranton, Reza Doragon, Storm Release, Laser Dragon S. After which a massive dragon made out of bright electric beam of energy erupted from his hands and with frictening speed vaporized both Kirinins and causing a massive explosion and blew the house apart. Also during the fight Killer B found himself surrounded by eight Kirinins. He only one man kill him, shouted a Kirinin as they charged him. You suckers don't know who you're messing with, said Killer B with a smirk, after which he took out all seven of his sword on his back and holds the seven blades in between the joints of his arms, left armpit, both elbows, right leg, stomach, the right side of his neck, and in his mouth. He then started to spine around like a buzz saw and overwhelmed his opponents with all of the varying swings he did, the moves were so fast that none of the Kiri swordsmen could move or block any of his attacks. As Killer B was doing this he shouted out, I float, like a butterfly. And sting, like a bee. Cause I'm the eight-tailed beast, as he killed the last Kirinin. As Killer B was handling the Kirinins, he was unknowingly being watched by Sasuke, who had just killed several Kirinins himself with his katana. When he saw Killer B fight he and tried to follow his moves with his Sharingan but could not read his moves since they were too quick and simultaneous for him to read, even with his Sharingan. This of course greatly annoyed Sasuke at how he could not read Killer B moves. He then turned to his left where he saw Yugito facing off against five Kirinins, she quickly did some hand seals and then cried out Katen, Heinako, fire style, ash cat, T. After which she blew out a massive amount of ash out of her month that quickly went forward and took the shape of a cat with a cloud of ash behind it. The Kirinins tired to avoid it but they could not since the attack was too big to avoid and were enveloped by it. When they were enveloped the ash cut and burn all over their bodies, when the ash dissipated all that was left of Kirinins were just their charred and burned remains. Sasuke had tried to copy the technique believing that it might be of some use to him but much to his confusion his Sharingan could not copy the Jutsu. He then looked forward and saw Fu fighting against four Kirinins who tried to hit her with some water Jutsus which she was able to block with her earth Jutsus. She then did a few more hand seals and cried out Doten, Yomi Numa Earth Style, 
swamp of the underworld, where a large mud hole was made right under the Kiri Nin's feet and like quicksand the Kiri Nin's were quickly enveloped by the mud. And much like before when Sasuke tried to copy her jutsu, but just like with Yugito his Sharingan could not copy her jutsu, even though he could see it his Sharingan just simply would not copy them. This of course infuriated Sasuke, since his Sharingan should be able to copy practically any jutsu that he sees. But before he could think any more on why his Sharingan could not copy any of their jutsus, he was attacked by several Kirinins. As he fought them he was then joined by Kakashi who was now healed thanks to Sakura and went over to help Sasuke fight the Kirinins. After they had killed the Kirinins, they both turned around to see the Rakage who was battling a group of 20 Kiri Jonans who believed that they could overwhelm the Rakage by sheer numbers. As the Kirinins attacked the Rakage they tired to hit him with their kunais, kunai launchers, swords and jutsus but each time the Rakage would dodge or their attacks in the similar manner that he did with Rajuta. After a minute or so of doing this the Rakage went on the offensive and threw several lightning-empowered shurikens that suddenly appeared in his hands, where he extended the reach of his shurikens as well as the increased sharpness of them by channeling his lightning chakra through them, which made the look like large fuma shurikens once they were thrown. The Kirinins quickly dodged the shurikens, but thanks to the increased sharpness and extended reach from lightning chakra that the Rakage channeled into them, many of the Kirinins were cut badly from them. But what the Kirinins did not know was that the Shurikens were just a distraction whereas the Kirinins were busy dodging the Shurikens, the Reikei was busy doing hand seals. When he was finished the Reikage cried out, Brayton, Suzukiri, lightning style, cutting sparrow, you. After which over 20 lightning birds appeared around the Reikage screeching loudly and started to flying all around the disorganized Kiri group and started to hack at them to pieces as they flew by them or through them. Many of the Kiri group hand tried to dodge or block them but the birds simply just cut through their swords when they tired to block with them. Even when the Kiri nins dodge them or replace themselves with a clone or an object, the birds would just follow them and slice through the Jonans, some had even tired to attack the Rakage and kill him. The Rakage would bring the birds back to defend him and block any attack the Kiri nins made and then kill them. Within a minute or two all the Kiri Jonans surrounding the Rakage were killed with the body's pieces scattered around him. Both Sasuke and Kakashi had watched the entire fight and when they first saw the Rakage doing hand seals they both activated or revealed their Sharingans in hopes of copying whatever jutsu the Rakage was going to use. But much to Kakashi's surprise and to Sasuke growing infuriation, their Sharingans could not copy the Rakage jutsu. They then watched the Rakage use the Suzukiri jutsu to wipe out the Kiri group, both had been surprised by how powerful the jutsu was and how the Rakage used it to kill 20 highly skilled jonans and made it look like child's play. It made Kakashi even more curious since he had never heard of a powerful jutsu like that or any jutsu that was used in the way the Rakage used it. That of course left two possibility one which was the most likely where the Rakage created it himself, but would not explain why other ninjas knew it. Since from Kurani's report, from when she and the others were rescued from the hole two other storm nins knew it, and he found it highly unlikely that a cage would share such a powerful jutsu as that to his subordinates in case someone would use it against them. The other and less likely of possibilities, but still possible, being that Kumo has some unknown source that has powerful and unheard of jutsu. As they watched the Rakage a voice suddenly spoke up behind them, you will be unable to copy any of the Rakage jutsus or any of our own Hataki-san, Uchiha-san. When Kakashi and Sasuke quickly turned around, since they had been surprised that anyone had been able to sneak up on them with noticing them, since their shinobi senses were on full alert and yet they did not sense anyone come near them. When they turned around they saw a young attractive woman in her early twenties, Kakashi quickly recognized her as Okatsu from the description Kurani and the other gave of her in their report after being held in the hold. And may I ask how that is possible or how you know that we cannot copy anything from your group, asked Kakashi in his cheesy eye smile as if it was a normal conversation with a friend. At this Okatsu smirked this is the reason why your Sharingan cannot copy or jutsus or any of our moves, spoke Okatsu as she removed her fingerless teku to reveal a seal on the back of her hand. What is it? asked Kaksahi who was now even more curious. It's a special seal that the Rakage developed which emanates a special chakra pulsed field around the person who has it on them. Where it negates the special abilities or effects of dujutsus on people, hence it negates the copying ability and tracking ability of the Sharingan. Where you cannot follow our high speeds or copy our jutsus and moves and you cannot put us under a genjutsu with your eyes. 
The same can be said for the Huga clan's Byakugan, where they cannot see through our bodies and cannot see our chakra circulation system in our bodies, hence they cannot use their juke and gentle fist on us when they cannot see our chakra pathway system to begin with. Impossible, said Kakashi in complete disbelief at how such a seal existed at all, there no possible way that a seal like that exists. You have seen the effects already Hataki-san, Kanoa's famed Dujutsu, the Sharingan and Byakugan are worthless against us. Since every shinobi in Kumo from the lowest genin to the Reikage himself has this seal on them and the same with our allied shinobi villagers, said Okatsu with an ever-growing smirk on her lips, after which she then left to join the fight. Where she left and completely stunned Kakashi and an infuriated Sasuke, who was enraged beyond words at how Kumo or more specifically the Reikage had just insulated his clan by taking away their bloodline's greatest abilities. When Kakashi got over his shock, he could only sigh before he left to help in the fighting, if we survive this battle and get back to Kanoa, they're going to be one hell of a shitstorm when the Hokage and the council hears this, thought Kakashi as imagined their reaction. After the Reikage had dealt with the Kiri Jonans, Dragon quickly flew down next to him. Reikage Sama, I have just finished looking over the village, and it seems that our forces are driving back the Kiri forces. But they are putting up stiff resistance and our advance is slow, if we do not finish this quickly they will be able to call in their reinforcements and would overwhelm us, spoke Dragon. For a moment the Reikage said nothing, but then quickly looked up at Dragon and spoke. Have the Kanoa Nins, the wave defenders and our own people halt their advance and have them hold the ground, I will handle the remainder of the Kiri forces myself. Quickly realizing what the rakage meant Dragon nodded and made contact on his radio in his mask with the other Storm Nins, and told them of the rakage orders and then informed the wave defenders and the Kanoa Nins. Once the world was spread to the other forces the rakage prepared his next jutsu. It's time to end this battle, once and for all, thought the rakage, where lightning seemed to surround the bottoms of his feet after which he disappeared in a bright blue flash. Gundam 00 strike, as the Kono Nins and the Storm Nin and the Wave Defender held the ground against the attack Kiri Nins a bright flash of blue light suddenly flew right past them where as soon as it left several of the Kiri Nins suddenly started to scream out in pain and fall dead as blood started to erupt out of the bodies as if they had been slashed by a sword. The next second the blue flash came back, and going from one Kiri Nin to the next and killing them all in an instant before they could do anything. All over the village the bright flash of blue light started to appear and as it did Kiri Shinobis were falling like flies. None of the of the Kanoa Nins and the wave defenders could understand what was happening nor could their trained eyes keep up with the movements of the blue flash, since as soon as they saw it disappeared with a blink of an eye. All Kanoa Nins and the wave defenders could do was watch in complete awe as this bright blue flash of light slaughtered their enemies right in front of them. The Kiri Nins themselves were in complete pandemonium the moment the blue flash of light appeared as they did not know what to do, since as soon as they saw the blue flash either they or their comrade would be dead before any of them could do anything. It was as if it was there on second and gone the next. Within minutes the numerical superiority of the Kiri Nins was quickly dwindling down to nothing as Kiri Nins started to fall left and right to the blue flash as the blue flash appeared right in the middle of the Kiri Shinobi ranks and seemed appear in several places at once, as Kiri Nins fell almost exactly at the same time. Many of the Kiri Nins tried to hit the blue flash of light with their weapons or their jutsus but not of them could hit it as it was too fast for any of them to aim let alone fire anything. Some even tried to run away or dodge it but they were all too slow as they were killed within instant of trying. As the Kanoa Ninja watch many of them could only wonder what the blue flash of light was. What is it? Asked Kakashi out loud as he tired to follow the blue flash with his Sharingan, but found that it was too fast even for his Sharingan to keep up with and follow where all he could see what a flash of bright blue light like everyone else, it's like trying to follow Sensei when he used the Horatian no Jutsu, the flying thunder god technique, he thought. His question was then answered by Yugito who was standing next to him and heard him. It is the rakage, she said simply, completely shocking Kakashi and the rest of the Kanoa group. TTDR rakage, BB but how, asked Sakura, since although she knew he was powerful she could not believe that he was this powerful, where he could move as fast as the Yondime Hokage. By use of a special technique he created called Ripo, lightning steps. V answered Yugito. Ripo, said Tenton, yes, the technique involves the rakage constantly drawing lightning from the geomagnetic voltage of the earth to the bottom of his feet and using the repellent force to go from one place to the other in an instant. 
The technique literally allows the rakage to skate across the voltage that he has gathered and uses it to move at monumental speed where he can move great distances from point A to point B in a single step in the speed of light. He can also do the technique in midair by using the static electricity in the air and use it to the same degree and what more the technique requires little to no chakra at all. It is because of this technique that the rakage earned the nickname Saurite Blue Lightning, since when HHE uses the technique he is fast as lightning and makes a blue flash, replied Yugito. When the Kanoa group and the wave defenders heard this they were completely stunned to say the less, especially the Kanoa group, since the rakage had created a technique that was easily on par with the Yundaim Hokage legendary Horatian no Jutsu. As the rakage slaughtered the Kirinin some of the few reaming squad captains tired to regain control of their forces and reform them into a tight defensive circle. With all of them facing outwards on all sides and with all of their backs against each other so that the rakage could not sneak up on them from behind so that they would at least see him coming for them when he would attack. Just when they all got into position several of the men saw a blue flash at which the second they saw the rakage standing up on a nearby rooftop above them and looking down at them while holding the rajin in his right hand. If that rakage shoot him, cried a kiri captain as several of the other kinnin fired their kunai launchers, but the moment they fired that there was another blue flash and he was gone and several more of kiri nins fell dead. Where is he? cried one of the Kirinins as he looked around for the rakage. Looking for me gentlemen, spoke the rakage standing on another rooftop opposite the one he was on a moment ago. There, shoot him, said a Kiri Shinobi, as he and several others fired several water jutsus at him, but as soon as they fired him the rakage disappeared in another blue flash and another several Kiri Shinobis fell dead. Missed again I'm afraid, said the rakage mockingly as he stood in the middle of the street in front of the group. Kill him cried another Kiri captain as he and the remaining Kiri shinobis rushed forward to attack the rakage head-on. But as they charge at him, the rakage could not help but shake his head and then think how foolish they were. Where within a blink of an eye the rakage disappeared once again in a blinding bright blue flash and within a second or two he reappeared several feet behind the charge group of Kiri nins. Where he then deactivated the rajin, where as soon as he did all the remaining Kiri nins fell dead before they even knew that they were dead. Gundam 00 strike ends after the rakage killed off the last remaining large groups of Kiri Nins the remaining few quickly began a full retreat back to the landing beach to where the 200 reserves were in plane to make a last stand there. Upon seeing the remaining Kiri Nins retreat back to the landing beach, all the remaining wave defenders and all the Kanoa teams along with the rakage and all his storm teams perused after them, to drive them back to the sea back onto their ships and back to Kiri. For several minutes the Kanoa teams and the Rakage teams lead the charge forward against the retreating Kiri Nins with the wave defenders following behind them. As they perused them the kill or captured any of the remaining Kiri Shinobis that fell behind the others. When they got to the beach they found the remaining Kiri forces had joined up with their reserve forces and took up a defensive position and were ready to make one last stand. Kiri Shinobis I will give you this one and only chance surrender now or you will a die here, spoke the rakage as he believed that enough people had died today. Kiri Shinobis do not surrender, we will fight to the death, cried a Kiri captain the rakage just sighed knowing that, that would be their only answer, since he had heard that if any Kiri Shinobi surrendered the Mizukage would have their family killed or become leaves in his weapons factory and if they returned home in defeat he would have the Shinobi killed. Very well you have made your choice, sighed the rakage, where he then turned to Fu and the others as well as his storm nins. Fu you and the others drop your weapons and anything metal that on you, said the rakage and then turned to the Kanoa's teams and the wave defenders, that goes for all of you as well. What? cried Kiba, you heard him do it, ordered Yugito as she quickly dropped her kunais and shurikens on the ground as well as her gantlets and body armor. Along with Storm's Nins and the Rakage other bodyguards, because if you don't you will all die, so make sure that none of you have any metal on you. Quickly deciding to follow Yugito advice and following the other Kumo example all the Reaming Wave defenders and the Kanoa teams quickly dropped their weapons and anything metal that they had on them. When the Kiri Nins saw this, they at first thought that the Wave defenders and their Shinobi allies were surrendering. But that thought quickly evaporated when they saw lightning suddenly starting to surround the rakage body, once all his people and the Kanoa Nins and the wave defenders had removed all their metal equipment. Everyone in the surrounding area could literally feel the electricity in the air, as their hair stood up on ends. They could also feel and see the massive amount of chakra that the rakage was releasing and surrounding him. The rakage then lifted his hands up with his fingertips forward and then suddenly cried out, Sekara, Static Force, W. 
Suddenly ten long streams of lightning bolts erupted from the rakage fingers tips and hit ten separate Kirinins and started to electrocute them. The lightning bolts then spread to the other nearby Kirishinobis and it turn it spread to the other Kirishinobis, within seconds all Kirishinobis on the beach being electrocuted to death. Since the lightning seemed to spread from one person to the next connecting them in a web on death, where they were being electrocuted. As this happened happened all the Kanoa Nins, Wave Samurai and the Wave Militia could down was watch in shock, awe and horror as nearly 300 Shinobis and Kunoikis were being electrocuted to death right before their eyes. As they watched this many of them were slightly thanking the heavens that the rakage was on their side. After about a minute or so the rakage ceased his attack and lowered his hands, when the attack ended the charred burnt remains of the Kiri Nins fell to the ground. After which a foul smell of burnt corpses, overpowered the normal salty sea air where everyone that remained could smell the foul stench. After the attack ended it took a minute or so for the wave defenders and the canoas to get over their shock at that they had seen. A massive blast of water suddenly erupted from the sea, after which when the water settled they saw a massive crab creature about 50 feet high standing up in the water. Also on the crab was Rajuta, who by the look was badly cut up where his face had many different cuts that were still bleeding all over his face, which would no doubt leave scars later on. His uniform was also badly torn up and had dried blood on them. Don't think you have won this battle already rakage, roared Rajuta as he looked at the rakage with pure rage and hatred. Ha, huh, so he's still alive, said the rakage, after which he ripo to disappear and reappear in front of Rajuta and his crab summon on water, while everyone else watch from the shoreline. This is foolish Rajuta, you have already lost this battle your army has been destroyed you cannot win, spoke the rakage. I don't care about this wretched country anymore. All I care about now is killing you, roared Rajuta as he then ordered his crab summons to attack. Full, though the rakage as he dodged the crab summons claws as it tried to smash him with it. For several minutes the rakage continued to dodge the crab summons attacks until Rajuta ordered it to fire its homatsu wrapper, violent bubble wave, in which a huge wave of bubbles from its mouth. The rakage was just able to narrowly dodge the attack by jumping up into the air but as soon as he did Rajuta then ordered his crab summons to fire its Mizutepo water pistol at the rakage at which the crab summons fired a massive high-speed jet of water at the rakage from its claws. The jet of water quickly hit the rakage, but Rajuta quickly realized that the rakage he hit was an afterimage from when the rakage used his Zanzo Jutsu, since the rake then appeared to his left-hand side and charged at him with the Rajin in his hand. The crab summons quickly blocked the rakage attack with its hard shell claw and was able push him away. Quickly regaining his footing the rakage went of the defensive again by dodging the crab summons water attacks and Rajuta's Tobi Izuna attacks. The rakage finally grew tired of always being on the defensive and decided to go on the offensive. At the same time the crab summon fired another Mizutepo at the rakage, but instead of dodging the rakage charged forward and took the attack head on and blocked the attack with the Rajin. As the rakage struggled to hold the water attack off it slowly pushed him back, and just when then attack was about to overwhelm him. The rakage suddenly disappeared letting the attack go by and then reappeared right above Rajuta and his crab summons. What? cried Rajuta in disbelief as he suddenly saw the rakage appear above him. Your time is done. Surarai thunder slash cried the rakage and then fired a slashing crescent shaped blade of lighting energy down at Rajuta and his crab summons, and cut both of them in half and then caused a large explosion and scattered their remains into the sea. From the shoreline the wave defenders and the Kanoa Nins could only watch in disbelief, as the rakage took on both Rajuta and his crab summon of such size by himself, without summoning something of equal size and then kill them both with a single slash from his sword. But just as they got over their shock, they all suddenly heard hundreds of small blasts coming from the nearby Kiri warships, which were a good distance away from the shoreline. Gundam Seed Destiny OST 2 Kakusei Shinasuka when they looked up they quickly saw thousands of exploding kunais in the air heading towards them. Reacting quickly the rakage deactivated the Rajin and put back on his belt, where he did a combination of 51-handed hand seals and normal two-handed hand seals, after which when he finished he cried out, Tenpu Midet, Heavenly Wind Rage X. After which a massive explosion of wind came from the rakage and caused exploding kunais to collide with each other and explode or fall into the water and explode. Once the kunai were all destroyed the rakage then turned to look at the 20 kiri warships, after which he then sped off towards the kiri warships in amazing speed that caused the water to tear up around him as he head towards the warships. 
When the crews of the warships saw the rakage heading towards them they quickly reloaded the volley guns and repositioned them to fire directly at the rakage, in which the fired them all at him. As the rakage ran forward he saw the massive wave exploding kunais heading towards him. But he continued head on and dodged any of the kunais that would have hit him, and doing with such incredibly speed. That he created dozens of after images of himself and did not even slow down once as headed towards the warships. As he neared the warships the rakage jumped up into the air, whereas he did several kiri nins that were on the ships fired their kunai launches at him in the air which he quickly dodged and then landed on the nearest warship to him. As soon as he landed the rakage quickly used his ripo technique and with a few seconds he killed entire the ship's crew. After which he brought up both his arms and did a circular motion with them. Where lightning started to emanate from his two front fingers tip on both his hands and then pointed them both at two separate warships and then cried out, Niju by a Kurai, double white lightning. After which two powerful blots of lightning exploded from the rakage finger tips and destroyed the two ships he had been pointing to. After the two warships had been destroyed the other remaining warships quickly fired their volley guns on the ship that the rakage was on and destroyed it. Fortunately the rakage was able to use his ripo technique move away from the ship before it was destroyed and appeared on another one. Where before the ship's crew could he was on their ship, he stabbed the ragin into the deck of the ship. Where he channeled a massive amount of the ragin energy into the ship, along with a large amount of lightning chakra with it, and caused a massive explosion and destroyed the ship completely along with its crew. Just as the ship exploded the rakage had used his chakra to propel himself high up into the air to avoid the explosion. He then quickly channeled another large amount of lightning chakra into the region and cried out, Surarai, and created another slashing blade of energy that sliced through and destroyed two more Kiri warships that were next to one another. From the shoreline the Kanoa Nins and wave defenders could not help but watch in awe. As they saw the rakage take on an entire fleet of 20 warships by himself and was winning. Since he had already destroyed six warships and had but the entire fleet in a state of confusion. But the remaining warships quickly reorganized themselves and when the rakage landed down at the open sea water and used the water walking technique to keep above it. They surrounded him where they aimed their volley guns at him, while the Kiri Nins on board aimed their Kunai Lunikas and crossbows at him, where the rakage just stood still in the middle of them. From the shoreline those W Taching could see that the Kiri warship had now surrounded the rakage. The rakage is trapped we have to help him cried Choji as he, Lee and some of the others were about to run off and try and save the rakage. I wouldn't do that yo, said Killer B. He right if you guys go out there you just get killed, said Yugito. But the rakage needs help don't you want to save his, said Sakura urgently. Don't worry the rakage isn't that easy to kill, said Fu. Besides he's about to make his move, spoke Okatsu. Neji, Hinata what going on out there? Asked Kakashi as he wanted to know what Killer B and the others meant. He doing nothing he just standing there and, said Neji but suddenly stopped in shock while a gasp came from Hanata. Hanata, what is it? Asked Kurani worriedly. It's the rakage. Dot his eyes, they are starting to glow bright blue, said Hanata where as soon as finished. Everyone in the surrounding area felt a massive was of chakra coming from the rakage. After which the wind started to blow harder, the sea became rougher and the sky became darker as dark storm clouds suddenly appeared in the sky as if a massive storm was coming. The rakage the lifted up his arms up into the air and began to move them in circular motions, as he did the sea became even rougher and wind was starting to destroy the warships as the ship's masts were breaking. The crews of the ships and the shinobis on board tried to shoot the rakage, but the ships were rocking too much for them to fire them and the few that did fire saw that the wind just blew the kunai away. It was then that Konohamaru suddenly shouted over the hard blowing wind and pointed up to the sky over the rakage and the kiri fleet. When everyone looked they could not believe their eyes for lightning began to descend down around warships and the clouds started to twist around and around and tornado then began to form his the sky with a then quickly descended down around the rakage. The tornado then began to draw in all the Kiri ships around it, sucking them in and destroying them and killing or drowning their crews as well as scattering the ship's remains down into the bottom of the sea. Back at the shoreline the wave defenders and the Kanoa Nins could only watch in complete and utter awe as the rakage summoned a massive tornado and completely annihilated the Kiri fleet. Just as he was said to have done, nearly four years ago, when Mizu no Kunai and Kurgakur had sent a fleet of 50 warships and 10,000 men, to aid the former Lightning Daimyo in his civil war. 
it was in that moment that many of the Kanoa Nin made a silent prey that the Rakage would not side with Orokimaru and his allies in the war, for if he did Kanoa would surely fall. Within minutes of when it came, the tornado dissipated and the wind died down and the sky became clear again. Where once it did those at the shoreline could see the Rakage standing right in the middle of where the tornado was only moments ago, surrounded by the scattered ship wreckage of the Kiri warships and the floating bodies of some of their crews. Gundam Sea Destiny OST 2 Kakusei Shinasuka ends. At the shore the Kakashi and the others could only continue to stare at the now destroyed fleet and the man standing alone in the middle of it that is even if you could call him a man. For what they saw made them all actually believe that maybe just maybe all those other rumors that they heard about the rakage were true. Where they said that he was God made into mortal form, and that he could control the heavens and could level entire mountains with a single strike, since from what they just saw almost divine like. My God, now I understand why Kiri calls him the Arashi no Oni, demon of storms, thought and awestruck Kakashi. That, that was, said Sakura as she tried to describe what she thought, but words could not describe the how she felt or how to describe what she was seeing. Sasuke himself was completely stunned, as he could not believe what he had just seen either and just continually look out to the horizon or more specifically at the rakage and could only think of one thing, what power. It was then that the rakage suddenly disappeared in a blue flash again and reappeared a few feet away from the shore right in front of everyone. Which once again caught all the non-Kumo people by surprise at his sheer speed once again. As he slowly walked towards the group everyone could feel and almost see the dominating aura of power that the rakage was now being known to have. As he continued to slowly walk everyone that was directly in front of him immediately parted away so that there was a clear path in the crowd for him to walk through. The rakage continued to slowly walk by the crowd and walk through the burnt corpses of Kiri Shinobis until he came up to a Kiri Shinobi who was somehow still alive but was badly burnt on his face, arms and body. The Shinobi who the rakage was walking to was none other than the Chunin Saji who had been giving out rage to others to the Kiri invasion force. When Saji saw the rakage heading towards him he tried to crawl away but could not as the rakage quickly grabbed him by the front collar of his uniform and lifted him up to eye level with one hand. When Saji looked into the cold merciless blue eyes of the rakage, a man that his village had come to fear and know as Thirishi no Oni. He could not help but shudder in fear and nearly solid himself when he looked at the rakage who might as well have been the Shinigami himself as far as he was concerned. After a moment or more of just looking at Saji, the rakage spoke in a cold deadly tone of voice. What is your name? A minute or so Saji said nothing, but then was able to work up the courage to speak. SS Saji, well Saji, today is your lucky day, because I'm going to let you live and go back to Kiri, because I want you to deliver a message for me to your Mizukage, tell the Mizukage and the Mizu Daimyo that from now on Nami no Kuni is under the protection of both Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance. Where should they attack this country again or attack any other country that is a member, an ally of the Heavenly Alliance or even under its protection then I will bring the wrath of the heavens themselves down upon them, do you understand me, spoke the rakage in a dangerous tone of voice. HH hi, replied a scared Saji. Good, said the rakage after which he then dropped Saji on the ground and turned around to his shinobis. Leopard, panther. Heal him and once he full healed give him a small boat and enough food and water to make it the Mizu no Kuni. Hi Rakage Sama, replied Leopard after which he and Panther went up to Saji and then Shunshun, Body Flicker, away with him to treat him and send him on his way. Once Panther and Leopard were gone Tazuna and Anari went over to the Rakage, where they then went on their knees and lowered their heads on the ground. Thank you Rakage Denka, our country is forever in your debt, we were starting to believe that you would not arrive in time or you did not accept our petition to join the Heavenly Alliance and you not come to our aid, spoke Tazuna which of course shocked the Kanoa's teams at the fact that Nami no Kuni wanted to join the Heavenly Alliance. As my grandfather said our people are forever in your debt, if there is anything we can ever do for you please do not hesitate to ask us. For our country would surely have fallen had you and your shinobis not arrived when you did, spoke Anari. After Anari and Tazuna had finished speaking the rakage kneeled down to the two men and whispered something to them that, that the Kanoa nins could not hear. Also since the Rakage was wearing a mask and Anari and Tazuna were in front of him, neither Kakashi nor Neji could read his lips. When the Rakage finished whispering to them, both Anari and Tazuna went pale white as if they had seen a ghost. Anari looked like he was about to say something but before he could he quickly controlled him and kept silent. 
After that the Rakage stood up again and helped both Anari and Tazuna up on their feet where he then spoke. There is no need to thank us Tazuna-san, my shinobis and I were happy to help you, and the Heavenly Alliance is always eager to have new members and new allies. Besides when we got both your petition your message for help two days ago we were already finishing preparation for an expedition to help your country fight off the invasion. We would have been here sooner both our ship was delayed a bit by a storm and out main fleet fell behind. But they will be here tomorrow with two companies of Kumo Shinobi who will be stationed here to help protect your country if Kiri tries anything again and with food, medicine and other supplies to help rebuild our homes, spoke the Reikge after which he then went over to the Kanoa group and faced them. Greeting Lee San I had hoped to met you again, but I did not think we meet so soon and I would would be my shinobis and I saving you and your comrades again, spoke the Reikage. Yosh. It is good to see you again Reikage Denka and thank you for saving us yet again Reikage Denka we are in your debt, spoke Lee which the Reikage waved him off telling him it was nothing. He then turned to Guy, Maito Guy, it is an honor to meet you in person, spoke the Reikage respectfully. Your reputation as a shinobi and as a teacher of shinobis is well known and respected in Kumo considering how well you taught all your students especially Lee San. Yosh. You honor me greatly Reikage Denka with your youthful praise, I can see the flames of youth truly brightly in you, cried Guy which caused the Reikage to chuckle. After which he then turned to Konohamaru, greeting Konohamaru-san it is an honor to meet you. I have heard great deal of your exploits over the last few years you have earned yourself a worthy reputation in the last few years. Thank you Reikage Denka, Siad Konohamaru respectfully. Since after seeing what saw the Reikage do he thought it best to be respectful to him. The Reikage that went over to Tenten, Mikumo Tenten aka Okami Ken no Kanoa, Kanoa Blade Mistress, I also heard much about you your skill as a assassin and a swordswoman is highly regarded and respected in my bolt division. Thank you Reikage Denka, you are also an excellent as well, said Tenten politely, since from what she saw the Reikage was indeed a powerful swordsman. After that the Reikage went to Shino Kiba, Yamato and Shikamaru and greeted them all respectfully and spoke well of how skilled they were. He even spoke politely to Morgi, Udon and Sai although he ignored Sakura, Ino, Kakashi, Bor and Sasuke without as much as a word to them. This of course did not sit well with Sasuke since he found it a blatant disrespect to him and his pride as a shinobi. Finally the Reikage came to Neji and Hinata who both stiffened slightly when he up to them. Since although this was not the same Reikage that had ordered Hinata kidnapping and inadvertently caused Neji father death, it still did not change the harsh feelings they had for Kumo. When the Reikage came up to them he did something that no ever respect him to do especially the Kumo ninja nor Neji and Hinata be bow to them down to them and spoke. On behave on my village Huga Hanata and Huga Neji I wish to officially apologize for the wrongs that my village have done to you. In the attempted kidnapping of you Lady Hanata and in the death of your father Neji San, I'm sorry to say that during that time my village greatly shamed itself and I know it is little comfort to you, but I'm truly sorry for what happened to you both. It took a minute or so for both Neji and Hanata to get over their shock of what just happened, but when it did Neji spoke up. There is no need for you apologize Reikage Denka you're not reasonable for what happened to my father, since you're not the Reikage back then, said Neji respectfully since he had no real anger towards the Reikage especially after what he did just now. Maybe so, but I'm still the Reikage and even though I was not it when the incident happened, I still share the reasonability, since I, am the Reikage now and it is my duty to at least set the rights that my village has done over the years, replied the Reikage. We understand Reikage Denka and thank you, and thank you for saving my life as well as the lives of everyone else here when you and your shinobis arrived, replied Hinata respectfully. There is no trouble, since as I said to Tazuna-san and Anari-san my forces and I were already preparing ourselves to come to Nami no Kuni had when they asked for our help, replied the Reikage. Wait, you were already getting ready to head here. But why, blurted out Kiba, where the Reikage turned to him answer. For several reasons the first being that if Kirigakure and Mizu no Kuni took over Nami no Kuni, they would use it not only as a second front to attack your village. But they would also use it to blockade us from our newest members Umi no Kuni, Sea Country, and Suki no Kuni, Moon Country. As well as our long-standing member Cha no Kuni, Tea Country, and cut off our trading ships with them and cut them from us. 
Also the second and more important reason as to why we are here is because of the fact that Lady Daimyokuyuki of Hana, Yuki no Kuni, Spring, Snow Country, and Shibuki-san the leader of Takagaku, the hidden waterfall, asked me to reply the rakage. They asked you too. But why? They have their own shinobis and why would they care? Asked Ino. That's simple, because they knew that their forces would be unable to get here in time and Kumo is closer to it than they are. As for why they would care, that's even simpler both Takagaku and Yuki no Kuni have the same hero as Nami no Kuni has, and this is where his gravestone monument is so it's only natural that they would want to protect the country that his gravestone is. I'm certain you know who I'm speaking about since he was one of your shinobis until your village banished him and left him to be killed by the Akitsuki, one Uzumaki Naruto, spoke the rakage harshly as he narrowed his eyes. At the moment the rakage mentioned Naruto's name, most of the Kanoas winced at and lowered their heads. After a minute or two of silence, Shikamaru raised his head and decided to ask something that he had been wondering for a few minutes. Excuse men Reikage Denka, I know this is troublesome to ask, but you said you got wave message for help two days ago correct? Yes, the how did you get here so quickly, since it takes about three to four days to get here from Kaminari no Kuni by boat depending on the weather. It takes twice as long on land and you didn't use any of your airships, since we would have seen it, so how did you get here, asked Shikamaru. This of course got the attention of everyone else since as usual Shikamari was right. At this the rakage just chuckled and spoke, that very astute of you Nara-san, you certainly live up to your reputation. As for your question, that is how I got here so quickly. The rakage then point out to a cliffside off the coast to their left. When the crowd looked over to the cliffside they saw a ship coming from behind the cliff 8. The ship was a distinctive red and gold color in the shape of a bird, its bowsprit even resembles the head and beak of a bird, the sail resembles a pair of wings and can be detached to become a glider and the decorative wooden frill on the aft end of the boat looks like a tail. Altogether the ship was beautiful in very sense of the word. It's beautiful, said Eno, which everyone else agreed with as they all got a better look at the ship was it sailed near them. That it is and it is how my shinobis and I got here so quickly, spoke the rakage with a hit of pride. What is it called, asked Sai as he looked at the ship and hoped that later on he could draw the ship since it was rare to see such a beautiful man-made object such as this and wanted to at least know its name. It called the Suzaku, she is a one of a kind and is the fastest ship in the world, answered the rakage. That is quite a clam rakage Denka, said Kakashi as he admired the ship and had to admit it was beautiful and was indeed ship worthy of any nobility and of it named Nine. It is no clam Hataki-san it is a fact, since how else was I able to get here so quickly and besides it is made out of Tejina wood, spoke the rakage, shocking Shino, Kakashi, Yamato and Kureni while confusing the others. So what, what is this Tejina wood, asked Konohamaru, where Yamato answered for him and the others. Tejina wood is a very special wood that comes from the Tejina tree, which is extremely rare types of tree that can only be found in Mori no Kuni, forest country. The trees are very slow to grow where it takes up to 50 years to grow to full maturity and they need constant attention and are very sensitive to their environment around before they are full matured and can easily die if not cared properly and need chakra to help be grown. But once they are full grown they are extremely strong and hard to cut down, since the wood itself is very strong yet it is also very light. A block of Tejina wood is worth a single bar of gold, hence to make an entire ship out of it would cost a fortune, said Yamato, since he knew that to make such a ship was probably enough to bankrupt several small countries. This of course shocked the other younger shinobis as well as many others that heard Yamato's explanation. But why would people pay so much for this wood, even though it is rare and strong it still doesn't make any sense, asked Tenten. It because of the wood's property, since not only is it very strong where it can take a great deal punishments from stormy weather and explosions. It is also very light, so that it can move very quickly in the sea and is also resistant to most type of ninjutsu attacks due to being grown with chakra. Which is why it is so valued by so many people, spoke Shino. This relation completely stunned the other Kanoa nins and could only image how much the ship cost to make. But enough about my ship I think it is now best that we head back to the village and tend to the wounded, Team 12 will stay here and him with the unloading of the supplies on the ship and help bring them to the village, said the rakage. Where Team 12 quickly acknowledged their orders and shunned them to the ship. Just as the rakage was about to head to the village with the rest of his shinobis Kakashi suddenly spoke up. Rakage Denka please wait, where the rakage then turned to him. 
Rakich Denka, if I may ask you, where did you find the region? From our reports it was said to be lost about 10 years ago. When it and the man who helped stole it fell off a cliff char no kuni t country when battle against some of our shinobis, asked Kakashi. I took it after I fought and killed the shinobi named Rokusho Aoi, who I came across by accident, he was a missing nin from Omegakur Hidden Rain and was also a missing nin from your village as well if I'm not mistaken, spoke the rakage. Kakashi nodded, since it was very much possible that he survived the fall off the cliff and into the sea, since they never found his body. Rakage Denka, if you would, please hand over the region to us, since the sword belonged to Senju Tobarama who was one of the great founders of our village and was our Nadaim Hokage, said Kakashi. I am sorry Hataki-san, but I will not, since it was I who fought and killed Rokusho Aoi not your or any of your village other shinobis, hence to the victors go the spoils of war, said the Rakage neutrally. I'm sorry Rakage Denka, but I must insist that you hand over the region to me, as I said the region belonged to Senju Tobarama was our Nadaim Hokage. Hence it is a treasured heirloom to our village and it rightfully belongs to our Hokage Lady Suand. Since she is the great niece of the Nadaim Hokage and is his only remaining relative, hence we have the right of family inheritance as well, said Kakashi insistently. As I said Hitaki-san I'll not. As I am under no obligation to hand over the region to your village, since other than the peace treaty our villages signed 19 years ago. We have no other treaties with Kanoa hence I don't have to give you the region if I do not wish to, which I don't, spoke the rakage neutrally. Rakage Denka, I must insist that you hand over the region to me, said Kakashi forcefully, but immediately regretted it. For as soon as he tried to order the rakage to give him the rage and a massive killing intent flooded the area, it took everything Kakashi had not to buckle and collapse under the sheer intensity of the killing intent. He also was struggling to breath and couldn't even move his body as he was flooded with images of his bloody and grim demise. What killing intent? It's monstrous, thought Kakashi as he struggled to keep standing up, as he started to curse himself a thousand times over for being so stupid as to threaten the rakage especially after he just saw him destroy almost half of the Kiri invasion force by himself and then destroy their entire invasion fleets as well. The rest of the Kanoa teams weren't doing any better than Kakashi as they were now surrounded by Killer B and the Rakage other bodyguards along with the remaining Storm Nins with their weapons out. They were all struggling to breathe let alone keep standing up with the Rakage massive killing intent. As they had never felt such an overwhelming killing intent in their lives, even Sasuke was paralyzed by the rakage killing intent as a cold sweat fell down his face. He killing intent is so strong, it makes the killing intent Orokimaru used back in the Chunin exam look like a joke in comparison, thought Sasuke with twig of fear in his mind. Some of the Kanoa Nis turned around to see how the wave militia members and the wave samurai how they were holding. When they did they saw that the wave samurai and militia members were in an even worse shape than they were, since the samurai were on their knees breathing heavily and using their swords to keep themselves up. While the wave militia members were flat on the ground, either unconscious or simply unable to move out of pure terror of the killing intent. As the the rakage stood in front of Kakashi, who was on the verge of collapsing, Kakashi saw that the rakage now had an aura of energy surround him and his eyes were glowing bright blue where his eyes were actually emanating lightning from them, tend much to Kakashi shock and he saw that the sky had once again become dark with storm clouds with thunder in the background. You dare try and order me, the Rokudaim Raikake of Kumo around Hitaki Kakashi, spoke the rakage in a dark and ominous tone of voice. You forget who I, am, as I am the rakage of Kumo, while you are merely a jonin for a foreign village, and although you may be a famed and powerful shinobi from where you come from. As far as I'm concerned you are no more than an ant to me, and if you value your life you will never try and order me around like that again. For if it weren't for the fact that you and your comrades helped protect Nami no Kuni until my shinobis and I arrived, I would kill you where you stood for what you just did. I would have thought you would be more grateful consider I helped save you and your people's lives. I suggest that you learn some gratitude Hitaki, as next time I'll not be so merciful, finished the rakage as the aura around him died down as did the killing intent, his eyes stopped glowing and the sky became clear again. When the killing intent died down, both Kakashi and the other Kanoa nins breathed in a sigh of relief. I understand rakage Denka, said Kakashi while at the same time he birthed himself at treeing to force the rakage to do something he didn't want to, as he was certain he, Kakashi, nearly got himself killed and probably nearly caused a war between Kanoa and Kumo. What the hell was I thinking, he thought. 
Now considering what you done for Nami no Kuni I'll allow you and your comrades to stay and rest here for the night. But tomorrow I must insist that you leave Nami no Kuni and return to your own village, said the Rakage. You're kicking us out, cried Ino in disbelief. Yes, since Nami no Kuni is under our protection, you being here threatens the neutrality of both this country and the neutrality of the Heavenly Alliance, replied the Rakage. But how can you be neutral you're already involved in the war, since you attack Kiri twice both here and back the hold and their allies to Orokimaru and the others, cried Kiba. Our attacks on Kiri were not an act of war, the attack on the hold was to rescue mission of the Princess Sachi of Umi no Kuni. Who is to be the next queen of Suki no Kuni and an ally to the Heavenly Alliance? As for our intervention here, officially it was in retaliation of Kiri and Mizu no Kuni aggressive expansions against our trading routes in the Central Elemental Sea with other nations. As well as the illegal invasion of Nami no Kuni who was neutral in this war of yours and because of Nami no Kuni requested aid from us and petitioned us to be a member of the Heavenly Alliance. While unofficially we did it as a personal favor to Lady Daimyo Kicho and Shibuki-san of Takagaku, said the Rakage. But you recued Kuranai Basin and the others as well as helped the rebel forces free their prisoners from the hold, that makes you involved, countered Konohamaru. Officially all I can say to that is that it was simply a coincidence that the rebel forces attacked the hold the same time as us. As for your aunt and her teammates they simply followed us when we rescued Princess Sachi, who kidnapping was illegal from the start and we simply dropped you aunt and her teammates back on the shores of Hai no Kuni when we found them on our ship. There is no proof whatsoever that we have any involvement with the rebel forces of Mizu no Kuni and Kurgakur and we have no alliance with your village. There also no proof that we are in any kind of alliance with the rebel forces of Mizu no Kuni and Kurgakur, which would be against international law in involving ourselves in the internal affairs of another foreign country without their consent. To say otherwise would be conjecture and speculation without any proof to support the claim, since it would be simply our word against yours as both Kirigakur and Mizu no Kuni know when they accused us of breaking international law. I have already sent letters informing both Kirigakur, Mizu no Kuni as well as their allies as to why we intervened in the illegal invasion of Nami no Kuni, just as we did when we attacked the hold so to prevent Kiri from accusing us taking sides in your war and retaining our neutrality. Also unofficially whether we have any kind of alliance with the rebels factions of Kirigakur and Mizu no Kuni is not of any concern to you. Even if we did it still does not involve Iwa, Oto, Kusa and the Hanya clan regardless of their alliance with Kirigakur since it is their internal matter. As for your aunt and her teammates as I said to them when my shinobi saved them, I simply did it since I don't like having lives being lost needless and as collateral damage during a military attack, replied the Rakage. Troublesome, you're using political loopholes to keep yourselves out of the war and from taking sides it, said Shikamaru. As the leader of a shinobi village a cage must be a skilled fighter, tactician diplomat and politician, although the last one is a regrettable fact. Besides is it wrong to use such means to avoid war and the loss of lives? Kanoa itself has used similar means. My way at least does not involve lives being sacrificed to keep the peace or to cast out others to save ourselves, sneered the rakage. This caused many of the Kanoa nins to wince at the remark to their village history when it came to keeping its peace and security. Now that, that matter is closed I believe it is best that we return back to the village, since there are still many wounded there that need medical attention, said the rakage after which he and his shinobi shunshined away. Soon after the Kanoa nins and the remaining wave defenders started to head back to the village and help with the wounded. For the remainder of the day the rakage, his shinobis as well as the wave defenders and the Kanoa shinobis, helped to deal with the bodies of the dead and care for the wounded, including the wounded Kiri nins. After the most of the Kiri nins were cured of the poison and healed of most of their wounds, the rakage and some of the storm's nins, put chakra suppressing seals and paralyzing seals on them. So that they would prevent the Kiri nins from using their chakra and so that the storm members could paralyze their bodies if they should try to escape. Fortunately none of the Kiri shinobis resisted or even tried to make an escape, since they knew if they tried to escape and return home the Mizukage would have them killed for failing to capture Nami no Kuni. Also they knew that since the Mizukage would believe they were already dead then their families would not be harmed for being captured by Kumo. Since it had been decided that once the expedition force came from Kumo, the remaining Kiri forces would be taken abroad the ships and transported to Kaminari no Kuni, and held in an internment camp near one of Kumo's fortresses. 
Also later on that day some of the storm nins found the exploding notes the Sasuke team had planted underneath the walk path of the bridge. When confronted with this Kakashi had to explain what Sasuke had done and why he did it. This of course did not set well with the wave defenders especially since they knew that if the Kanoa group had been able to retreat bridge would had have been destroyed and they would have been left to slaughtered. When this revelation came to light it burned up all the remaining credibility that they had with the people as well as any that they may have gained when they fought alongside them in the battle. Many in the Kanoa group in turn blamed Sasuke for what happened since he had acted without orders and furthered isolated them from the people, Sasuke just simply ignored them since he had come pressing things to him to be concerned about. By the end of the day the body counts was over 580 Kiri shinobis dead not counting the 500 crewmen and shinobis that were on the warships and about 220 Kiri shinobis captured. Along with them were 100 or 30 dead or wounded wave militia members and about 28 wave samurai killed and another 12 wounded. The Kanoa group only lost one member to the group Badger, while the rest were of them were fairly badly wound but would live regardless. While the Rakage and his shinobis lost none of their members and they only had a few small wounds and scratches on them. The losses wound have been heavy and their wound have been a lot more seriously wounded but thankfully the sum of the storm nins with the Rakage were skilled healers. Where they were able to help Hanata Sakura and Ino heal a lot of the wounded from the battle, hence the casualties would have been a lot higher than they were. Later on that night at Naruto's gravestone late that night when the full moon was covered behind several large black clouds, a tall dark figure stood in front of Naruto's gravestone. The figure just stood there for several minutes looking down at it and the items that were around it, like the ramen bowl, Neji old headband, the steel plate Shikamaru left, Kiba's picture of him, Naruto, Choji and Shikamaru together Tenten silver kunai, Konohamaru goggles, Lee's leg warmers, side painting of Naruto and the white orchid that Hinata left. The figure went lift to the photo and the painting to get a better look at them in the dark, but put them back after a minute or two. After which the figure then knelt down and just looked at what was said on the gravestone and ran it through it. Just as the figure had finished running its fingers through the letters of the gravestone it suddenly felt something coming, where it then quickly disappeared in a swirl of wind. After the dark figure disappeared three more figures appeared in the clearing, Two of the figures were shorter than the third but were almost equal in size and both were female due to the shape of their bodies in the dark. The three figures quickly hopped over the large stones across the pond and stood in front of Naruto's gravestone in silence. As they stood there the full moon came out of the clouds to shine down on the clearing. The clear water reflected the full moon and the bright stars in the sky and made the clearing all the more enchanting under the moonlight and stars and the fireflies now flew around it. As the moon appeared from behind the clouds it also revealed the three dark figures to be Kakashi, Sakura and Ino. Even though they had not been allowed to come with the others when they visited Naruto Gravestone they still wanted to visit it and thanks to Sai they could. Since before he and the others went to meet Inari men to lead them to the gravestone, Sai had used his Choju Giga, Super Beast's imitation pictures, to create an ink mouse to follow him and the others as they went to Naruto Gravestone blindfolded and the back to the camp. After they returned to the camp Sai then summoned the mouse back to his scroll where it revealed the location of Naruto's gravestone. He had done this because he knew how much it meant to his wife and to Sakura and Kakashi to visit Naruto's gravestone and pay their respects to him. It's beautiful, said Ino as she looked around the clearing and at the gravestone. It is and I glad that despite the harsh life Naruto had, there is a place like this to remain the world what kind of person he was. I only wish his body could have been found so that he could at least find rest here, spoke Kakashi soberly. For the next minute or two the three of them just looked at the gravestone and read the words on it over and over again, reminding themselves of the betrayal to Naruto and how they turned their back on a good person when he needed his friends. Somehow I'm sorry just doesn't make up for what we did, spoke Sakura suddenly. It because it doesn't really and no matter how much we wish to Naruto isn't coming back and we can never make up for abandoning him, said Kakashi. As he looked down at his former student's gravestone, seeing it reminded him of him past shame of how he abandoned Naruto for Sasuke, simply because he believed that Sasuke needed it more, due to what happened to his clan and that Naruto could handle himself and that he did not really need much help. Sadly he had been wrong, since Naruto needed just as much help as Sasuke, since his childhood was just as bad if not worse than Sasuke's. He didn't even visit Naruto on the night before he was official banished from the village, since he believed at the time Sasuke needed more help and needed to know that he could become strong enough to fight Itachi and Kanoa. 
Kakashi thought he could say goodbye to Naruto when he official was banished, but sadly that didn't happen his Naruto left the night before so that he would not become a spectral to the village. Afterwards when Naruto death spread Kakashi finally realized how fool he had been and how he had abandoned his student for another simply because he was easier to teach and was more talented than the others. He had abandoned his teammate and student and never tried to train him properly like a real sensei should have and it lead to his death, it was just another failing in a long list of failings in Kakashi life. As he looked at Naruto gravestone he could also see Naruto face on the gravestone looking at him with shame, he had failed not only as a teacher but he had failed to protect his sensei's legacy and he had failed his friends. It was then that Obito words came out of the back of his mind like a specter's ghostly voice, those that break the rules and regulations are scum. But those who abandon their comrades are worse than scum, and he was worse than scum. After a few more minutes of just standing at Naruto gravestone they all took out some incense and lit it where they made a silent prey for Naruto. After they all left the gravestone one by one but not before they each said one finally word. May you find peace in the next life Naruto, spoke Kakashi. Goodbye Naruto, said Ino was had tears in her eyes. Naruto, I'm, sorry, said Sakura who also had tears in her eyes. After which once they crossed the stone pathway on the pond they left the clearing and head back to their camp. Unknown to any of them the dark figure that had been there earlier came from behind the shadow of the trees, where he had been watching them and then disappeared again in a swirl of wind. The next morning the next morning the Kanoa group, along with the Rakage and bodyguards were in the middle of the great Naruto bridge, where the Rakage was bidding farewell to the Kanoa group. This is where we part ways have to say, please give this to your Hokage and your council, it contains a copy of the letter that we have sent to Kiri and its allies as well as your ally Suna. It states our reason why we intervened when Kiri invaded Nami no Kuni and stating that Kumo and the Heavenly Alliance as well as our allies, will not enter this war and not take sides in it. We will remain neutral in it, spoke the Rakage as he handed the letter to Kakashi who nodded. I understand Rakage Denka, spoke Kakashi respectful, since he did not want to be on the receiving end of the Rakage wrath again. Just when the Kanoa group were about to leave the Rakage stopped them and spoke. Wait, although we are not allies, we are still not enemies either, so I wish most of you luck in the war. Also even though I have no great respect for your village I still hope you come victories in your war against Orokimaru and his allies. Since I would not be sorry to see him or his allies the Yondaim Suchikage and the Godaim Mizukage fall, since their crimes against their own people as well as many other people are great, said the Rakage. Thank you Rakage Denka we shall be careful, replied Kakashi as he and the others then turned around and started to run off in the direction back to Kanoa. As they traveled through the forests of Hai no Kuni, everyone in the Kanoa group as they remained silent as they ran, since they had much to think about after what they saw and learned yesterday. Even though everyone was thinking about a different event yet all the things had one two things in common, they involved the Rakage and Kumo. Also Kureni, Choji, Sakura and Lee were all have a sense of deja vu of last month when they were traveling back to Kanoa, after being recued from the hold by Kumo. In which like before they could only wonder the reaction of the Hokage and the council, especially certain members like Koharu and Danzo, when they learned what happened in Nami no Kuni and what they had seen yesterday. And like before it was certain Kanoa was going to be in for a big surprise very soon. NA1. There are three separate waves in this attack and are positioned on all four sides of the village and each wave consists of 200 shinobis. 2. A more advanced form of Hanata's Degeki Sendo immense amount of chakra into her fingertips and then releases it in a massive concentrated pulse wave of chakra through her fingertips into any object that she hits, usually the ground where she creates a massive shock wave that causes the ground or anything else that the technique hits, to be completing torn apart and destroyed. 3. A Jian is a Chinese double-edged straight sword. 4. Citreep is a military term used in most militaries, it means situation report. 5. Tenten has two elemental affinities in this story one is lightning while the other is wind. 6. Fitting don't you think, since considering Naruto's nickname as the god of thunder and lightning and he is the rakage. 7. Since they were able to channel their chakra to their feet in time to stay still. 8. See profile to see image of ship named Suzaku 9. Suzuka the Japanese name for the Chinese vermilion bird and is often associated with the phoenix. 10. Imagine Raiden's eyes in Mortal Kombat non-canon jutsu.
A. Kamageki, Divine Strike, a more advanced form of Hanata's Degeki Sendo immense amount of chakra into her fingertips and then releases it in a massive concentrated pulse wave of chakra through her fingertips into any object that she hits, usually the ground. Where she creates a massive shock wave that causes the ground or anything else that the technique hits, to be completing torn apart and destroyed. B. Chakra Hari Chakra Needles, another technique that Hanata created where she creates Shenban needles made out of pure chakra and fires them into certain parts of the target's body to paralyze them. C. Izuna, Rice Rope, also the name of a wind spirit, a Kenjutsu technique that allows a swordsman to create an air vacuum that is caused by a pressure wave, which is created by the swordsman when he swings his blade and channels his wind chakra into it. The attack blows away all opponents with the air vacuum and cuts their bodies with small wind blades at the same time. The wind blades cuts are so fast and so precise that the wounds they make do not even bleed, but hurt greatly and can prevent a person from moving for a short time due to the pains of the cuts. D. Byakurai, White Lightning, a lightning technique, which is one of the rakage signature techniques. The technique can only be done by a lightning user who has a high affinity to lightning and control over it. The technique requires no hand seals, since the user has to concentrate a large amount of his lightning chakra into his or her fingertip, where once the user releases it, a powerful lightning bolt is fired from the user finger. E. The rakage's floating technique, by channeling a large amount of lightning chakra around his body and into the metal soles of his boots. The rakage can create an electromagnetic field around himself and magnetize the metal soles of in his boots to lift him up into the air and levitate in the air. F. Matoi Izuna, Wrapping Wind Spirit, another Kenjutsu technique which is used when a user swings blade downward to the ground and channeling his wind chakra through his sword and realizing it and creating a powerful pressure wave blast. That is so powerful that it will destroy the very ground as it travels to its target and will do devastating damage to whatever it hits. G. Raihei, Lightning Wall, a lightning technique, which can be summoned by the rakage without any hand seals, the technique allows the user to create a large wall made out of lighting protecting the user from high-powered attacks. The technique requires a high affinity to lightning since, the technique draws static electricity in the air to create the wall of lightning and control it. H. Tobi Izuna, Jumping Spirit Wind, another Kenjutsu technique where the user channels his wind chakra into his blade and swings it to create a crescent-shaped air vacuum blade. That can slice right through stone walls or cut a person in two with such speed and precision that any wounds caused by wood will not bleed. I, Zanzo, after image. This technique is a taijutsu technique that causes an optical illusion, where the user moves from one place to another and another with such incredible speed. That they leave an image that continues to appear to the opponent's vision, after the exposure to the original image has ceased. It then takes several seconds for the image of the person to disappear and for the opponent to realize that the person is gone. Making the opponent believe that the person has not moved from where he was until the image disappears. JK's Noa to me, Wind of Pain, a wind technique that creates a vortex of wind that is blasted at a target and sends the target flying away, while at the same time causing severe lacerations all over the target's body. K. Kutetsu no Toga, Steel Spike, a steel technique that requires the Koten, Steel Release Bloodline, where a user creates steel spikes from out of the ground to pierce his enemies from the ground. L. Tentaya, Celestial Arrow, a special technique that the Ashida clan can use thanks to their bloodline. Where the user creates an arrow of concentrated chakra from either a specially created bow or a bow made out of chakra and the fires it. Depending on the amount of chakra used the user can either simple kill a man with the technique like a normal arrow or blow up an entire house form one strike. Also when fired the user can change the arrow's direction or target when fired, since the arrow is made out of the user chakra. M. Kubaton, Chika plant style, scattered flowers, a pant technique that requires the Kubaton plant release bloodline. Where the user creates hundreds of flowers to grow around their target and uses this technique to scatter the flower's petals. That has chakra covering them to sharpen their edges and have them fly around in a spiral sphere around the target and then collapse on itself shredding the target to pieces. N. Kuchio's no Jutsu Ukamida, summoning technique wolf pack, a summoning technique from the Kisaragi clan, where a user would use a summoning technique than would summon a pack of wolves to attack the user's enemies. O. Tendu, Heaven's Kick, a Taijutsu technique that the Mugen Tenshin Ninja clan use where a member would kick their target up into the air and the jump up after them, before the target could recover from the kick. They would then use a falling axe kick on the target sending strength down into the ground and causing massive damage to the target. P. 
Hayden, Go and Ryuga, Secret Art, Ultimate Dragon Fang Blaze, a fire technique that can only be used by a member of the Yun clan and that has the right and dragon release bloodline. The user inhales air and then exhales a massive long wide stream of super hot fire with incredible speed from the user's mouth like that of a flamethrower. That will burn any targets that are hit by it to a crisp. Q. Kazushini, Wind Death, a wind technique that created by using a weapon like a sword or another long sharp weapon. When swinging the sword down and channeling a large amount of wind chakra into it. The user can create a massive gust of wind and create a dozen or so crescent wind-shaped blades, whereas the gust of wind temporarily blinds the target with the strong wind blowing its face the with blades would then hit the target and slice it into pieces. R. Tsururai Thunder Slash, a lightning technique that the rakage created by using the region. The technique works where the rakage uses the region own pure electrical energy and combines it with his own lightning affinity and unleashes the combined power into a slashing blade of electricity capable of cutting most things. Depending on the amount of power that the rakage uses he can create a small blade of energy to cut a man in two or destroy an entire house with a single slash. S. Ranton, Reza Doragon, Storm Release, Laser Dragon, a storm technique that allows a user of the Storm Release bloodline to create a massive dragon made out of electric energy that will destroy any target it hits and leave no trace of it. T. Katen, Heineko, Fire Style, Ash Cat, a fire technique that Yugito created where she blows as out of her mouth and the has takes the shape of a large cat made out of ash with a cloud of ash behind it and charges forward at its target. When the attack hits the target the person will be at first be cut by the high speed of the ash blowing past them. But after the ash is settled around the hot ash will burn their bodies up. Yu, Raten, Suzuki Re, Lightning Style, Cutting Sparrow, a lightning technique that allows the users to create several birds or more, depending on the amount of chakra used made out of lightning. Where the lightning birds will fly around and cut the targets that they come in contact with. The lightning birds can also be controlled to go to whatever direction the user wishes with hand seals, if he or she is proficient enough in their control of their elemental affinity and chakra control. V. Ripo, Lightning Steps, a special a movement technique that allows the user to move faster than the eye can follow that the rakage created where, the rakage draws on the geomagnetic voltage derived directly from the earth and channels the voltage to the bottom of his feet and supercharges them and the ground around him allowing him to go to point A to point B in a single step. The technique works where the rakage has to constantly draw the voltage from the on the geomagnetic voltage of the earth to the bottom of his feet and using the repellent force to go from one place to the other in an instant. The technique literally allows the rakage to skate across the voltage that he has gathered and use it to move at monumental speed where he can move as fast as the speed of light. The technique itself is extremely difficult to master than the where the user has to have an extremely high affinity to lightning and extremely high control because of the amount of voltage the user has to draw and control. The technique also uses little to no chakra his the rakage draws the energy he needs from the earth itself. He also can down the technique in midair where he draws on the static electricity from the air itself, although he cannot maintain the technique as long as he can in the ground his there there isn't enough electricity in the air as there is in the ground. W. Seikara, Static Force, another special technique that the rakage created himself where he generates a massive amount of lightning chakra to his fingertips. After which he then unleashes stream of lightning bolts out of his fingers tips to hit it targets where they will be electrocuted. When dealing with large groups the lightning bolts will spread to other nearby people, if they have any metal on their bodies, since the lightning will be attracted to the metal, much like how a lightning rod attracts lightning during a storm. X Tenpu Midair, Heavenly Wind Rage, a wind technique that creates a massive explosion of wind from its user location. It has enough force that it can easily level everything in its path up to a mile. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe and see you guys later.